Okay, we set to go. We are now live on Channel 8 and YouTube. Great, thank you. I'd like to call the meeting of the Narragansett Regional School District School Committee to order. Um, and we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. So we have our flag. And there's our flag. If we could rise for the Ple Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, United States, States, States of America and to the and Republic, Republic for which it stands, stands one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great, thank you everyone. Um, this meeting is being live streamed and recorded by Templeton Community TV. So thank you very much. It's out on the cable channels. It's also being live streamed um, to the YouTube channels, which I'm just gonna pull up right for myself at the moment so I can keep track of public comment. Um, and it will also be available on video on the TCTV YouTube channel at any point in time for anyone who wants to watch the video. So we thank TCTV once again for uh, partnering with us to make this happen. I'm going to announce who is on the call tonight. Just wanna to make sure I have everybody written down before I start reading. So this evening for the school committee, we have Mr. Marks, Mrs. Chartier, Mrs. Robichaud, Mrs. Matson, Mrs. Kojal, Mrs. Trifolo, and myself, Mrs. Hughes. Uh, Mr. Mason, I'm assuming will be along shortly. Dr. Casavant, superintendent of schools, Kate Calise, the assistant superintendent, Amory Geister, the business manager, and Susan Varney, our administrative assistant who keeps us in order. We also have this evening, uh, Matt Holloway, our director of, uh, I'm gonna get the, the, the exact title wrong. It is the director of pupil services who will be doing a presentation in just a bit. Uh, Eric Iben representing the uh, NDEA. And we also have Abby Bennett and Callie Weedle from our student advisory committee, their representatives. So without further ado, we'll jump into the agenda. We have a lot of meeting minutes to approve. So I'm going to run through them as quickly as we can. And let me get my list so we can do roll call votes. So the first uh, is the approval of the meeting minutes of February 17th, 2021. I would entertain a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. I have a, a motion by Mrs. Kojal. Do I have a second? Second. And a second by Mrs. Chartier. Any questions on those minutes from February 17th? Seeing none, we'll do roll call vote. Mr. Marks? Yes. Mrs. Chartier? Yes. Mrs. Robichaud? Yes. Mrs. Matson? Yes. Mrs. Kojal? Yes. Mrs. Trifolo? Yes. And Mrs. Hughes says yes. So those were approved unanimously. Next up, I would entertain a motion to approve the meeting minutes of February 25th, 2021. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion by Mrs. Trifolo. Do I have a second? Second. And I have a second. I think that was Mrs. Robichaud. Uh, any questions or comments on the minutes from, I lost my place. Oh, right in front of me, February 25th. Seeing none, we'll do roll call. Mr. Marks? Yes. Mrs. Chartier? Yes. Mrs. Robichaud? Yes. Mrs. Matson? Yes. Mrs. Kojal? Yes. Mrs. Trifolo? Yes. And Mrs. Hughes says yes. So those were approved unanimously. Next up, I'm going to do two sets of minutes together. These are the open session of two meetings we held that really only had content in the executive session. So these two minutes only include, we open the meeting and then motion to go into executive session. So I'm going to handle them together. Um, so I would take a motion to approve meeting minutes of both March 1st, 2021 and March 8th, 2021. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Marks. Do I have a second? Second. And I have a second by Mrs. Triflo. Any questions or comments on those? Seeing none, we'll do roll call vote. I do want to announce that Mr. Mason has joined us. And Mr. Mason, the motion on the floor is to approve the minutes from both March 1st and March 8th. So if you'd like to vote, you can let me know when you, we get there. Um, and also Lisa Parker from the NDEA has also joined us. I just want to announce that and I'm going to write it down. So we have the motion on the floor to approve March 1st and March 8th. 
Uh, no questions or comments, so we'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Marks? I'm gonna abstain from this one. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Chartier? I was not here on the 8th, but I think I can still vote to accept the minutes, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, Mrs. Robichaud? Yes. Mrs. Matson. Yes. Mrs. Kojal? Yes. Mrs. Trifolo? Yes. Mr. Mason? Yes. And Mrs. Hughes says yes. So they were approved. We did have one person abstain from the approval of those two minutes. The next set of minutes is from March 3rd. I would entertain a motion to approve the meeting minutes of March 3rd. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion from Mrs. Trifolo. Do I have a second? Second. And a second from, I think it was Mrs. Kojal. We'll go with, uh, with, with you, Deb. Uh, any questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Marks? Yes. Mrs. Chartier? Yes. Mrs. Robichaud? Yes. Mrs. Matson? Yes. Mrs. Kojal? Yes. Mrs. Trifolo? Yes. Mr. Mason? Aye. And Mrs. Hughes says yes. So the meeting minutes of March 3rd were approved unanimously. So thank you everyone. That was a lot of minutes. And we are done with that section. Uh, next up, we have bills and payroll. I would entertain a motion to recommend to accept the bills and payroll warrants as presented. So moved. I have a motion from Mrs. Kojal. Do I have a second? Second. And I have a second from Mr. Mason. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Marks? Mrs. Chartier? Abstain. Mrs. Robichaud? Yes. Mrs. Matson. Yes. Mrs. Kojal? Yes. Mrs. Trifolo? Yes. Mr. Mason? Aye. And Mrs. Hughes says yes, so it was uh, approved and we had one, uh, one person abstain and everyone else voted for. So thank you on that. Next up, we're gonna get to our student representatives. We have both um, Abby Bennett and Callie Weedle with us tonight. So I will turn the floor over to either one of them, whoever, whichever one of you wants to start. We'd love to hear what you have to say this evening. So thank you for joining us again. Thank you, Mrs. Hughes. Uh, since our last meeting, we have been fortunate enough to open up the school a little bit more. Students now have the opportunity to enjoy lunch at the school and stay for the full day when they're with their cohort in person. Um, many students are very grateful to be in person for the longer days and are looking forward to being in the school for the full week um, after April vacation. Um, as of now, cheerleading and indoor track teams have begun having practices and then softball, baseball, and outdoor track are right around the corner. And um, students have expressed you know, how grateful they are to be back in school and doing what they love doing um, and are excited to see what the next season will hold. Um, a few clubs and honor societies have also begun having meetings again. Uh, the Triumph Music Honor Society members have been coming into the school to work on some projects. Um, so the band is ready when they're back in full swing. Um, the concert band has been practicing various pieces and with the good weather coming, they're hopeful to be back outside and practicing again. Um, the Warrior Leadership students have continued to work on their projects, um, including the uh, Google Hangout they've started. Um, you know, they've had the, the game nights, they have a town newsletter, study group, um, social media profiles to promote um, the achievements of students, especially the senior class. Um, then talking about the senior class, they just announced that they'll be having a, you know, a close to normal end to the school year with plans for the various award ceremonies, um, hopeful for some senior fun days, graduation, prom, um, and a few other events. Uh, various members of the senior class have reached out sharing their excitement to hear such the good news um, and are very grateful to have the supportive administrative staff um, and their class advisors said they do. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Callie? Our student advisory subgroup, I'm part of the school spirit subgroup, and we put together a survey for supporting teachers and students during the time we're in. We received responses from almost every high school teacher from our district. And at our last meeting, which was yesterday, we went through and analyzed each response to come up with different ways to help the school and the teachers and staff 
run their classes smoothly to get more student participation, which went really well. Great, thank you, Kelly. Were, were you finished? I couldn't tell. Yes, okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments for Abby or Callie? No? Um, thank you so much for such a great report. It's so nice to hear that we have so many activities um, that are focused on not just the students, but I, but I love the fact that you're also focusing on the staff. Um, and the building as a whole. So um, it's wonderful to hear that everyone is reaching out um, to everybody that's been impacted, which is the entire community. So thank you so much for that. And uh, you know, again, we look forward to you participating. Um, totally understand if you need to drop off at any point this evening, if you've got homework or other activities or commitments, um, but we hope that you hang out with us. And if you have any comments, just let us know. All right, thank you. Okay, next up we have um, the, our Director of Pupil Services, Matt Holloway. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kazimant first, who can introduce him. Absolutely. So um, it's, this is one of the, um, you know, I, I would say one of the effects of COVID is that um, we're not always, we're not in person a lot. And I think that uh, Matt has probably been pushed off more times uh, given the business of the day in terms of um, pre presenting to you. So, um, I know that folks have heard a lot about him. They certainly have read uh, a lot of what he's, uh, what he's accomplished since he's been here. Um, so I'm really, it's, it's really, there's no need for introduction seeing that we've talked so much about the work prior. So I'll turn it over to uh, Matt so he can uh, give you his presentation and obviously introduce himself. Thanks, Dr. Casavant. Thank you, Chair Hughes. Um, so I'll, I'll be fairly quick. I, I, this is, it's kind of funny because this is my intro my introductory um, connection with you guys, but but at the end of the day, um, there's been a lot of work going on, and I, I thought I would kind of quickly catch you up to some of the things that we've done, and then um, you know certainly be more than happy to take questions or, or comments as they come up. So I'm going to try a screen share. Um, I'd say that I successfully share my screen like maybe 40% of the time. So if you got if I pop up my email inbox, just be patient with me. Is, are these slides okay? Wonderful. So, um, so I'll, I'll kind of go through the slides. Oops, see, I'll go through the slides and then, um, you know, but, but feel free to stop me at any time, um, I'm flexible. So uh, by way of introduction, um, I just, I guess I just want to take a second because it has been nine, 10 months that I've been here, but I, I do want to say that um, over this time, it's, it's really been an amazing experience to be in a district that is from, from top to bottom, so incredibly supportive and understanding of uh, the complexities of student services, special education, and, and then all of the protected categories of students that we're, that we're looking out for. Um, you know, from the school committee, policy subcommittee making on the fly changes to, to help us meet and exceed DESE expectations, to uh, superintendent's office, building principals, teachers, paras, um, gen ed, special ed. This is an incredibly supportive and understanding district. And I'm I just feel very lucky to have uh, arrived here. Um, my previous uh, position was in Greenfield. I was the um, pupil service director there. Uh, and then before that, I was with uh, the Department of Ed. So, you know, it's been, it's been a nice sort of landing for me here in Gansett, and I'm, I'm excited to be here with, uh, with you all. So those are the topics I'm gonna go through. Each one's kind of got a, a little slide. As I said, don't hesitate to um, interrupt me if you wanna weigh in. I start not by accident with parent and family engagement, uh, I really strongly believe that, you know, special education and the federal IDEA really are built around a partnership with, with families and parents. Um, and as you all know very well, the uh, special ed parent advisory cabinet is, um, is kind of the formal representation of that partnership. But I really, I really think that this entire department is incredibly committed to collaboration with parents. And so what you see there are just a handful of kind of the ongoing things that we do with the with the CPAC, so we have we have co-chairs at the CPAC that I meet with um, monthly or, or more often than that, in addition to the meetings themselves. Um, they recently just added at least one officer, maybe two more officers, and they're currently reviewing their bylaws, um, all of which is, is actually required by state law. You know, they're a public body, a public body that is, um, that is, that is appointed or created by the school committee. Um, and, and I think in future sessions, we haven't talked about this too much, but I, 
I want to do a better job, I think, of bringing their message to you. And I, I actually considered inviting them tonight, but I thought, let me just sort of have my have my moment in the sun, and then I'll get out of the way and let the parents really connect directly with the with the committee instead. Um, this year, especially, I've I've said this to the staff all year, has really been a PhD in family engagement because of the COVID circumstances. Um, and so then I was sort of the new the new director, uh, also trying to field questions of a very you know emerging, evolving situation around COVID. And um, we did a series of Q and A sessions that were really well received um, as the summer came to an end and the school year ramped up. Uh, because there was a bunch of special education considerations that had to go in, into place there. I also want to say the CPAC, you know, CPACs are an interesting um, body because it's a fully volunteer run group and, and some have more or less formality than others. Uh, frequently, the special ed PAC becomes sort of a, a parent support group. Um, and that's, that's fine. That's totally appropriate. But, you know, the sort of there's, there's, a, there's a sweet spot where it's advising the district and also supporting other parents. And I think our co-chairs saw that there was enough of a need for parent support that they, they actually started another group, you know, an offshoot of the CPAC that is really just there to, to give parents advice. And uh, Dr. Kassman can, can tell you, I mean, just a, an hour ago, you know, something came through from that group that, that you know, we're working with the building principals to address. And, and it's just nice to have, you know, multiple forums for parents to come to. So the next few things are things that my office organized or helped uh, facilitate just around supporting parents this year. One was for all parents, special ed or not, um, just working on, frankly, the technology skills that are required to be able to support remote learning. You know, some of us are, we, we didn't come to this from an even from an even starting point. So some of us needed a little extra help with the Chromebooks and the Google Hangouts and the Google Chrome and you you know, you, you name it. There's a lot of things that, that need to be done. So we organized some workshops uh, after school, um, after school in the evening, one in person, one over Zoom, to just help people work through some of those core issues with uh, the technology. Uh, we also, of course, well, we did a, uh, this was a big one, um, behavior support when you're doing remote learning. And this is more of a, you know, kind of our IEP parents were asking for support in this area. Although we did have parents who didn't have, who whose kids were not on IEPs come. Um, it was facilitated by the May Institute, Dr. Whit Whitney Kleinert, and actually I recorded that and posted it on the district uh, special ed page. So, you know, if anybody comes along and says, oh, I wish I could have made it to that. We have a shorter, it's about 20, 20 or 30 minute version of it that's on the district page. I'm happy to point you towards that if anybody uh, would like access to it. And then finally, every year, you know, the, the district is obligated to provide a parents' rights workshop. Um, and we just did that. We, we um, outsourced it to the Federation for Children with Special Needs, a wonderful organization, and, and they did a nice job um, and I'm meeting with the CPAC chairs in a couple of days to talk about some of their feedback there. So I'm gonna keep going through my slides, uh, but again, stop me if you want, um, and, and I'm happy to back up, go forward, go faster, slower, whatever helps. Another big part of my job, of course, is uh, staying compliant with state and federal law, regulations, et cetera. Um, I came in and we were uh, at the very beginning of a, what DESE now calls their tiered focus monitoring program which is actually monitoring across like basically any, any imaginable education statute, reg, whatever you want. It's all kind of bundled into their, to their TFM process. And we were uh, particularly being looked at regarding special education, ELE, uh, ELL education and civil rights under the tiered focus monitoring. Um, it's a long and, and somewhat um, thorough, it's a very thorough process as, as mo most of you know already, I'm sure. Um, so, so that was something that we finished up just, just about a month ago. Um, and then educational stability is a slightly less intense process, but also I would argue just as, um, just as important because we're looking at, you know, are we doing right by our kids who are in foster care, kids who are um, displaced, homeless, uh, you know, doubled up, et cetera, and students who are uh, attached to military families. Um, so, so not as intensive a process, but I think, you know, also a highly at-risk set of, of um, students. And I'm happy to say both final reports came back with 100% legal compliance with no legal or no corrective action whatsoever, which is, um, which is not common, at least in my experience, it's, it's uh, not common. So, and of course, I, you know, I, I was the lucky guy, I got the baton, you know, uh, 100 yards from the finish line. So, so I don't take the credit for that. But, uh, but it was a great thing to see and a great thing to hear. And I know, uh, I mentioned this before, but but the um, committee's policy subcommittee, met and, and really on the fly made changes both under the ed stability 
criteria uh, around, I believe it was around foster students and also um, civil rights, some of the civil rights language around the protected classes of, of uh, students and citizens. Hey, so that was a big deal. That was, that was a big hurdle to get over. Um, Matt, just want to take a second. I, you all know this, but but the amount of work that had to go in for hey, COVID Matt. adaptations, supporting special populations, it's kind of like everything that we've been doing as a whole district, we had to do it again, slightly differently for special populations. Um, so, you know, first things first, like all these IEPs, you know, it's not like they are no longer legally binding. They are, they are equally binding, whether we're in a remote model, hybrid model, or, or some, or in person. Um, so what we had to do is figure out how do we, you know, fulfill the federally guaranteed promise of the IEP in a hybrid or remote model. Um, and, and that was intense. You know, these liaisons, they had, we had the two weeks of professional development time, but if you were working in the special ed office, you, you did not have two weeks. Those are not lazy weeks. I mean, we were, we had to literally have, um, you know, personalized conversations uh, or email conversations with every single special education family in the district to make sure they were comfortable with how we were proposing to, to deliver, you know, all of their related services in a hybrid remote or, or in-person model. So it was, it was a pretty intense time for our staff. Um, oh, Chair Hughes, you have a question? No, I actually, I just wanted to, you know, to back up to that previous slide for a minute. Yep. Because I, I think that um, this slide itself deserves a moment of recognition um, to, as you said, yourself, but the entire team. Um, I've been in a position of compliance um, for a large bank and it is no great feat to go through the stress of having an organization come in and literally word for word tear apart everything you have, um, but to come back with 100% in compliance with no corrections needed is really something to celebrate. And I wanted to make sure that that message was passed along, um, you know, to yourself, uh, obviously starting with Dr. Kazavant, to everybody who every day, it's the, all of the people in our organization who actually make this happen, because it's not only just having the words on the paper, but it's living it um, and making sure it's implemented correctly too. So I really wanna express, you know, um, just my admiration uh, to the group for making this happen and make sure that the, the, the kudos went out to everybody, um, especially for this slide here. I didn't want that to pass by. Thank you very much. Yeah, and this, and this office definitely had a little celebratory uh, Friday afternoon as a result of that, of that finding for sure. Right. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Dr. Kassman, did you wanna weigh in on that? Um, I'm going to wait to the end. How, how okay. is that? We'll let you just keep the flow. Sounds good. Um, so, oh yeah. So like I said, just, just the sheer quantity of work that went in on, um, on adapting, you know, the protections, not only for special education students, but, um, item two there, I just wanted to say, you know, so obviously our kids, our students as a whole were divided into cohorts A or B. Uh, they continue to be in that boat for a little while longer. Um, but the state came out with, uh, you know, helpful guide, guidelines in terms of which students uh, we needed to prioritize for more time in person. And so the criteria you see there is the criteria that was that we um, actually adapted adopted directly from state guidance. Uh, so so those four categories of students that you see there um, were were brought in uh, for four days a week, A plus B. Um, we called them category C initially, but that led to some confusion. So we, we kind of stuck with this A plus B through most of the year. Um, that final category D was one that, um, you know, the, I just have to give a lot of kudos to the special education liaisons and, and really all the teachers, because there is a degree of subjectivity in that category, particularly uh, in the early going when we really didn't have a clear read on, on what the state and others meant by cannot engage in remote learning due to disability related need. So our staff has been amazing, both in terms of the internal decision-making process, and of course, ultimately, you know, myself, the principals, and the superintendent's office. But but the staff are really the one we follow their recommendations, and they've been a, they've done a great job of I think, you know, picking up criteria on the fly, applying it, and let's be honest, the hardest part, which is communicating it to parents. You know, this can be a hard message to communicate, um, and I think we've we've done a great job. We have not, um, of course, I always knock on wood when I say things, but we have not had any substantive you know, parent complaints around this process. And we've tr really tried to be 
fair and criteria based and transparent um, every step of the way. Um, I did include a link to the to kind of the seminal or foundational staff presentation that I put out if anybody wants to see it and kind of articulate the case for why, you know, why is it? Why is number two the way that it is? Um, and then number four, you know, as Ashley shared uh, last month, you know, we really have, and, and this again is, you know, me, me taking the baton, um, we really have staffed and, and more importantly, I think programmatically work to uh, improve social emotional mental health supports. We have another administration of the uh, universal screener that you heard about um, coming up shortly. And, you know, as, as we look at a wave of students returning to us, you know, and, and returning to us full time, we're very much uh, cognizant of the fact that, you know, we don't know what we don't know in terms of, of student mental health needs coming in. And we feel that this screener provides really important data for that, um, as well as, you know, as well as the telehealth supports and the, and the school-based supports and all of those things. Um, and final item on this slide, I just want to say for those of you who have been, you know, sort of doing this for a while, ESY is kind of a known entity when it comes to special education. Usually it's about 15, 20% of your IEP students are, are eligible for ESY. This year, because of the sheer amount of um, time missed, school time missed, uh, you know, we've followed the guidance of uh, area, other area districts that we've talked to and also our legal counsel. And we've opened up the extended school year program to any student who has an IEP. So a survey went out to all of those parents last month, and we're currently kind of going through those lists and, and um, building that program for, for all kids with IEPs, one year only as a, as a, what I might call an advanced compensatory measure to sort of get out ahead of any uh, concerns around, around time lost on learning for kids with IEPs for this year's summer program only. Um, I'll just keep going unless, you know, and please don't hesitate to, to jump in if you have questions or comments. Um, so I just wanted to do a quick overview. I know Dr. Kassman touched on a lot of this uh, recently. We have seen a, an increase in the total number of students who have IEPs um, in the district. You know, a couple of things. Number one, that's a state and national trend. I was just on a call with uh, Western Central Mass directors a minute ago. And I mean, literally, you know, this, this is something we're hearing everywhere. Um, you know, we're taking a long, hard look at root causes behind it. As you can imagine, there's there's many. You know, I mean, just off the top of your head, you could, you know that we have fewer opportunities to do gen ed interventions, you know, before we come into the special education realm. Certainly, we have fewer uh, opportunities for students to um, uh, no longer qualify for special education just because of the lack of in-person instruction, um, you know, move-ins. Really, there's there's a number of root causes behind it. Um, and we're looking at that closely and, and putting a lot of work into our eligibility process to make sure that, you know, we continue to follow um, state federal guidelines around that. Um, the number two and number three are relevant to, well, actually two, three, and four are all relevant to fiscal. Um, I know you saw an increase on special ed transportation. Um, you know, we're hopeful that, that things will come in under, you know, that, but, but the reality is that Vanpool cannot put as many students onto a given van, you know, and so that's, you know, we're hoping that that uh, as as state guidance evolves, that too will evolve. We're already seeing that that it is, um, but but that's the the main driver in terms of that increase. Uh, I know that you saw uh, an increase in, in in tuition costs for uh, private students out of district. Um, that is, as you know, you know, special education math one does not always equal one, um, and and different programs have wildly different. Uh, price points, as you all know. I do want to flag the point that, that we have actually decreased our out-of-district numbers overall, and, and um, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, just like number two, that, that number three will find ways to come in under, but, but you know, um, that is sort of the current reality. Um, and then number four is one thing, and, and I know that this was in your packet. Um, we are, jo we have joined, or we are, we, as of tonight, actually, we can approve the amended Keystone Collaborative Agreement, which, which brings Gansett in as, as a member district there. Um, and that's, the, you know, that's an exciting thing. That had to go in front of their board. And then um, they drafted uh, a revised agreement, which then went to the state. State approved that revised agreement. That came back to them. So now you all have um, that draft copy in your packets. All of their other member districts also have a copy of that agreement in, you know, in their hands. And so um, according to, to their to their leadership, um, final approval of that is due from those districts by April 30th. So 
hopefully starting May 1st, we can realize the savings, um, which is, which are pretty substantial. Um, you know, the, the, just the, the tuition savings alone are, are substantial, but I want to say this item 4B on my slide, it really means a lot to me and it means a lot, I think, to the students, um, which is that, you know, if, if we are represented in their board, we really can help craft the kinds of programs that our, our kids get access to. And, and that really goes a, a long way. Um, you know, as you can imagine, these, these things are complex programs, you know, which befits the, the complexity of the students that are in them. And, and so, um, you know, if we have kids in those, in those um, programs, you know, I think it, it benefits all of us to, to have a voice in, in what kind of programming is offered to them. Um, final slide, uh, just to talk a little bit about what's on the horizon for the rest of this school year and next school year, in addition to all of the incredibly complex work that we're doing um, day to day, you know, minute by minute, it feels like. Um, but, but definitely uh, looking hard and working closely with principals and staff on PD and, and uh, superintendent's office on PD opportunities. Um, we really want to, we've seen some um, reading data in our, in our upper elementary and middle grades that we really want to take uh, action on. So, so um, with state grant money are looking to really train up um, three of our special ed teachers as interventionists within the, um, within a multi-sensory reading intervention approach. Um, so that's an exciting thing. That'll be an ongoing, ongoing thing and that will lead, lead to them having, um, uh, you know, a certification in that area and, and really major impact on, on some of our students. Um, we also have, there's more to that. You know, I, I, I can go into more detail if you'd like. Um, we're also making big strides towards a more comprehensive PD program for our paraprofessionals. We think that's really important. These folks are incredibly important to the life of our schools and specifically to, you know, to the experiences of our, our students with IEPs. So we want to provide them with high quality PD. Um, and then just an ongoing uh, program, ongoing uh, high quality program of, of PD. Um, and, and, you know, the superintendent's office and Kate Calise especially have been great partners in and doing that work, we're currently in the thick of um, a pretty major PD uh, effort with, with cross-district staff. Um, curriculum, so, so for kids with really, really intense needs, significant needs, you know, the kind of students who would take the alternative MCAS assessment, um, we really want to have high quality evidence-based curriculum around that. And so we are using state, um, uh, a state grant to try to bring in the ACEs curriculum for, for a small subpopulation of our students. Um, you might imagine it as kind of activities, activities of daily living driven curriculum. Um, and it's interesting because this district, as you know, our, our, our intensive needs are spread quite thin, uh, quite broadly across the, the grade levels. So this is the kind of thing that can be, you know, we can drop this in and it doesn't require a full program. It's, you know, we can drop this in for this individual student at grade four, this one to grade seven, this one to grade nine, and it can still make a big, really, truly a, a huge impact on that student and their family in terms of, you know, the learning that they, that they really need. Finally, um, pre-K, you know, uh, we have a fabulous pre-K program in this district, um, and, and I, we just, I just see this getting, getting better and better um, and working very closely with, uh, with the elementary school principal and the superintendent's office on, um, positive behavior supports for the pre-K pre classroom. And uh, because a lot of these students come to us at age three with really intensive needs, whether those needs are on paper or, or you know, they come to us with intensive needs from early intervention. And so to meet those kind of incoming students, we, we want to have um, a severe needs teacher, not necessarily a, a self-contained program, but a teacher who is able to meet those students with their sets of needs and, and support them so we can have successful transitions into kindergarten, pre, you know, um, gen ed, pre-K, um, you know, or, or whatever is appropriate for the student. So, um, so that's exciting work and, and it really is just getting started and, and look forward to, you know, sharing more with you as, as we move forward. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, Dr. Kazvin, I'll throw it to you to add in any comments. So I think that I'm gonna go back to, um, I'll call it the grade that we received from the Department of Ed. Um, uh, I, you know, that Matt um, put it very nicely about it really as it was a team effort. Um, we did talk about our last, um, you know, evaluation, um, and it wasn't it wasn't as strong. Um, and it uh, we really our staff did an excellent job correcting some areas. 
Um, I'm going to say this when, when we had the out briefing, um, the gentlemen who were speaking uh, were giving us, you know, basically the, um, the out, just the summary of how the, the how we did. Um, they made it made it a point to say that that we he actually used the word exemplary, and I wanted that to be somewhere in the report, but um, around social emotional learning, and he just he he really did. They don't gush often. Uh, matter of fact, they don't gush at all. But they um, but they said that they had not had seen they not seen anything. You can't do it really much better than what we're doing right now in terms of what we have in place and what we have in terms of moving forward. So again, you know, it's nice to hear those things, especially when they are your priority. Um, so, you know, Matt, um, Matt and his team have done a fantastic job and I, I, you know, really we're, you know, we're in good hands and we're moving in the right direction. Any comments or questions from the committee on anything that Matt's presented? Because I know we do need to talk about the um, the Keystone Education Collaborative Agreement because we'll have to do some sort of motion. But before we get to that, is there um, does the committee have any questions or comments? Okay, I'm going to say seeing none. That was um, very uh, informative, Matt. So thank you so much for presenting what's going on um, with your, your team and the impact that you have across the district um, in, in all grade levels and, and on everyone. So it's really appreciated. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Keystone Education Collaborative Agreement. Um, we had um, passed a motion, God, it's probably, I don't know, four months ago or something, maybe five, I don't remember how long ago, um, to explore joining the collaborative um, and it looks like they have accepted us and uh, the Department of Ed has also then gone ahead and approved the addition of Narragansett to the group of schools that are part of this collaborative. Um, I was reading through the document and it is all dated July of 2021. So I'm, I'm just unsure and I wanna make sure we make the right motion to cover us no matter what. Um, the other thing I noted on the document is that there's a signature line for Dr. Kazavant, so we'll need to include part of the motion to, you know, have him sign on, on behalf of the school committee in the district, of course, um, but we also need to appoint um, either a school committee member or the superintendent, um, so I'm, I'm looking at all the school committee faces, I see no one jumping up. Um, that's changed their mind since we last met. Um, so our representative will most likely be Dr. Kazimit. So we'd want to appoint him as well. Um, so again, I don't know, Matt, if you have any insight as to the actual start date so that we can craft our motion properly to cover us. That's a, that's a great question. I, um, I don't. And I think if you craft a motion that focuses on the signature, um, and, and just leave the start date open to, you know, the quote unquote powers that be, I think we'll be in good hands there. Um, I'm just looking to see, I don't have anything from him that gave a, an active date other than a verbal conversation when he said, when it's signed, then we'll apply the discount. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting as I was reading through some of the fine print because I start reading and I should stop myself, but it did say that normally additions will happen the beginning of the next fiscal year and, and yada. Um, so again, I just, I didn't know. So I think you're right. If we focus on, uh, we'll motion to have Dr. Kazimant sign for us. Also normally in the May time frame, we do appoint our representatives to, we, we do it to CAPS, we do it now to Keystone, um, plus to every, all the other different uh, things in the district we need to do. So we have that time frame too, if we need to, to, to get the official appointment made so that it's on the record that he's our, our uh, authorized representative, I believe is the term that they called it. So, okay, so if that makes sense, I'm going to attempt to craft something. Um, and if someone has a way to improve it, uh, that I would entertain a motion to um, approve our members to, to accept the membership into the Keystone Education Collaborative and have Dr. Kazavant sign on behalf of the school committee and the district to join the collaborative. Um, and I guess that's that probably covers it. So moved. I have a motion by Mrs. Koshal. Do I have a second? Second. And I have a second by Mrs. Matson. Uh, any questions or comments on that motion? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call. Mr. Marks? Yes. Mrs. Chartier? Yes. Mrs. Robichaud? 
Yes. Mrs. Matson. Yes. Mrs. Kojal. Yes. Mrs. Trifolo. Yes. Mr. Mason. Aye. And Mrs. Hughes says yes. So that was unanimous. So Dr. Kazavant, um, if you would put your signature on that document and we'll move it along. If anything changes and we do need to make an official appointment prior to that May timeframe, just let us know and we'll get it on the next available agenda to make that happen. So thank you very much. Uh, any, uh, and again, anyone have any other questions for Matt before we uh, let him go for the evening. Obviously, you're welcome to stay and join our meeting. If you have other things to do, that's that's fine too. Okay, seeing none. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. We look forward to additional updates as they come. And uh, we're going to move on to the next section. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, next up is public input. We have quite a few pieces of communication that were submitted for public input. I've asked Mrs. Varney to read them. Um, they are all attached to the agenda, so people can go out and look at the actual uh, public input documents if they so choose, but I've asked, as I said, Mrs. Varney to go ahead and read them. So I'm going to turn this over to you, um, Susan, and take your time. If you need a break, let me know, and uh, we'll go from there. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Lots to read tonight. Okay, so our first letter comes from Ann Lyons. She's a Templeton resident. Dear school committee members, it has been brought to my attention that the administration is making plans to cut one of the music positions that is currently attached to the high school. I'm extremely concerned at the slow and st steady dismantling of a program that I have been st a strong advocate for for a very long time. It was a slow start when the district decided to start the instrumental, excuse me, instrumental program on a middle school level rather than at the elementary level. Then in recent years, decisions progressed to no lessons, then progress further to not having a multi-grade level band class in the middle school. It's been a lot of making do with what we have. And in my opinion, the students deserve better than that. With all that being said, I do know how fortunate we are to even have a music program still. But that also being said, I think if we are going to do something, it's worth doing right. By cutting this position, you are taking away the opportunity to really expand the music education curriculum. We should be moving forward by adding electives that do not just revolve around the performance piece of music education. As a community member, I would love to give you my ideas that would be the start of a successful and competitive music program. When you're talking about a music program, you have to look at it as a whole, not just by individual levels. Music is like math. Each year it builds off what you learned the previous year. Understanding that the work a district puts into the elementary students now builds a strong program six to seven years from now on a high school level. You need to walk before you can run. My suggestions first, make the position you're about to cut a full-time position. By doing that, you would allow for more flexibility in scheduling. We could start recorders in third grade, instrument lessons in fourth. By doing this, students, by the time they get to middle school, will have a solid base of rudimentary skills to continue their education and technique and learning to play as a cohesive unit. You could start skills in marching and jazz. It would also give a teacher the ability to move between the three buildings to focus on vocals such as chorus. On a high school level, we could be offering music labs such as music production that could work directly with the performance groups to produce the music that they work on, teaching collaboration and team building skills, as well as understanding the work behind the finished product. Do you realize that we have had students go to music, go to school for music, production and film scoring, and never had the opportunity to explore in high school. Finally, we should be working with the Winchester School District to include their students as much as possible. Before the pandemic, we were in the process of developing a nice co-op with them. The teacher that was working with us left them, but their students didn't. There are students there floundering and looking for a home. This could be just beginnings of a truly successful and competitive music program. It is a real rebuilding time due to COVID. I feel that if we cut this position at this point, it would be a grievous, a grievous error. What I am not sure you understand is that it only takes one to two years to dismantle a music program. In today's day and age, every school around us is claiming to be a STEM school with a focus on it. Narragansett needs to be 
that one school that thinks outside the box. We need to add that focus on the arts, visual, musical, and theatrical, and become a STEAM school. Remember, the majority of people turned to the arts during the pandemic as a stress release. Unfortunately, it took a pandemic for some people to realize the value of the arts. But with everything we ask of our students, we should be using the arts as a daily stress release within the school day. Considering we have such a focus on the psychological well being of our students, we should be taking advantage of this outlet. We should be that school that people turn to send their children to cultivate their creativity. We have a gifted and talented teachers running these programs, and we need to give them the freedom to do what they do best. I have sat by time and time again and watched their peers treat them as if what they do isn't important or what they do doesn't matter, that they are only there to cover preps and it's time the district proves those people, proves to the people that they are wrong. There may not be a standardized test attached to the arts, but every time a student puts themselves out there, either in a performance or through a piece of art they have created, that builds more individual character than any standardized test. As you are aware, my daughter was a student in this district. She graduated in 2018 and received, and I received a front row seat to watch how a musician education, I'm sorry, a music education worked on improving her brain function. It wasn't that long ago, I put together a packet or articles and studies that I gave each and every one of you describing the importance of it. I believe to this day that Patty would not be the person she is and as successful as she is if it wasn't for her music education. To go from practically nonverbal parallel play autism with severe ADHD with a hearing loss to now a double majoring at UMass Amherst with a recent acceptance from the Eisenberg School of Management for Hotel Tourism Management and a second major in psychology. She is hoping to work for the theme parks to help make improvements for people with disabilities. I credit her perseverance and self-confidence and ability to channel her ADHD to be able to multitask to what she has learned through music. I truly believe if we treated music as a core subject, you would see positive changes in students as we know them now, including scoring on standardized tests. The phrases, if you build it, they will come and you have to spend money to make money come to mind. I feel by doing this, when it comes to open school, when it comes time to open school choice again, you'll be having students on all levels knocking down our door to be a member of the warrior nation, always bleeding blue and lions. Music booster president. Okay, that's the first one. <laughs> Um, next, we have a letter from Christine Bennett, a Phillipson resident. Dear school committee, Dr. Cassavant, and all it may concern, I understand that the current budget proposal for the 21-22 would eliminate a music teacher at the middle school. I'm writing to ask you to please reconsider and find the money to keep that position intact. Please realize that we were very lucky to be able to save staffing money for the years when Mr. Clapp was here to continue teaching his high school science class and took on the band and chorus as well. But that was a fluke to have that combination of skills in one person. Since he left, we simply need to replace a science physics teacher. And that should not come from the expense of the entire music program. Other costs have the course, I'm sorry, other costs have of course increased in the meantime but this should not be reviewed as an extra cost. It is a necessary replacement of a necessary position. I've written to you all several times on the value and benefits of our historically strong music program, and yet has been dramatically weakened over the last several years. The students have lost individual lessons and multi-grade group rehearsals, and the numbers of students staying with the program through high school has dropped as a result. But that is not a reason to say that it's okay to reduce staff accordingly. It should show that we need to reinvest in the program, which always was and could be, and could again be, sorry, I lost my place here, could again be very important to many students providing a sense of belonging and purpose. In order for that to happen, we need to keep the same number of teachers in the program. At the middle school level, there are several selections in the UA general music class offered. So all students can have a basic exposure to music theory, which can be applied to many careers outside of performance. It would not be possible for one person to continue along with chorus and performance and band classes, especially since the revised schedule made it impossible to have one combined band for multiple grades. 
we absolutely need to keep up to keep two teachers there. There's also one of the programs which brings other students to our district. This is our known strength. The three current music teachers have worked together and have been incredibly flexible and creative in trying to reach and accommodate as many students as possible, including visiting the elementary school to drum up interest in the program. As I and many others have written before, the earlier children are exposed to a program, the more successful they will be. Imagine if there were no T-ball, Pee Wee or Pop Warner programs available to elementary and the younger and middle school students. What do you think the interest skills and level I'm sorry, what the interest in skill levels would be for high school athletics, not very high. It's the same with music. And our kids deserve the chance to have both. And that requires some investment in the schools and the community. Our teachers are willing to put in the time, effort, and dedication it will take, but two cannot do the work of three. Mr. Hurst has been an amazing addition to the program at the middle school chorus and beginner band and the high school marching band. Mr. Salvador continues to lead the major middle school ensembles provide students a showcase for their growing talents. And Mr. Shetler has, has great plans in the works to continue our high school concert band and chorus and broaden our other fine arts offerings at the high school. Our students deserve the chance to experience all that they have to offer. Please vote to raise the budget enough to replace the high school science position and leave the music program as is. As always, this one teacher will make a world of difference. Thank you, Christine Bennett. Okay, let me take care. Okay. Another letter from Lauren Witz, retired music director from Narragansett. I'm writing to express my concern about the proposed cut in staff at the high school music department. The performance opportunities for students have been severely impacted by this pandemic. The music just stopped. As we look to return to some sense of normal in our schools, the performance classes, band, chorus, and theater need to be included. The elimination of the high school position will place an impossible burden on Tom and Duncan to restore what has been lost this year. Another year spent without these classes will deal this department an insurmountable blow. The school committee, superintendent, principals, teachers, parents, and community have long supported the strong music program of NRSD. It is a program second to none. I do not believe making this staffing cut makes sense. You have a brand new school equipped and ready to expand instrumental, instrumental music instruction to fourth graders. This situation alone was difficult for the three staff members that you have. In closing, I ask that you please give Tom, Duncan and James an equal chance of restoring the sounds of music to the halls of your schools. Some of a student's best middle and high school memories are created in the music room. I've been a member of this teaching community and I continue to be so proud of the students that I taught and all the concerts performed. Keep Gansett music strong. Thank you for your time and consideration in this matter. I wish you all the best as you bring your schools back to in-person learning. Sincerely, Lauren Witz. Those are all the letters regarding the music program. Um, we have a few more letters. So this one is from Templeton resident and parent, uh, Julie Kibbe. To the school committee, first, thank you for your continuous support of our kids through budget constraints, pandemics, and crisis. I understand that your roles are ever more difficult, as are the decisions you need to make regarding our children's education. The reason I am writing today is because the disruption of our kids are all inevitably going to experience going back to the physical school building due to the commissioner's orders. Fortunately, my family has been able to keep our kids home this whole time with minimal disruption to our daily schedule. I'm not going to sugarcoat this past year. I work full time and it has been a challenge to juggle increased responsibilities at work. I work in the medical supply chain with monitoring kindergarten and fourth grade learners. It has taken quite some time to get the hang of getting all the daily kindergarten work accomplished and the fourth grade work reviewed and inspected for completeness and best efforts. This late in the year, it does not make sense for a to make a change for the kids who are doing well with remote learning. For some kids, there's no choice and they must stay home. They must stay remote due to individual circumstances. I was disheartened to learn that sending hybrid kids back full time was prioritized over keeping some semblance of normality, normality for our full remote learners who are making gains in fractions, reading and electives. For my kids, if I was going to send them back, they would have new classrooms, new teachers, new everything, which would be very challenging and disruptive to learning. 
Learning is the goal of school, right? In Chris Cassavan's letter dated March 12, 2021, he states, some of NRSD students may experience changes in their teacher or location of their classes. This is because we need to deploy our teaching staff differently in order to fulfill our obligation to open our schools fully in person using distancing guidelines. When challenged on social media, he responded to an inquiry about guidelines with a response that caused a great deal of concern. He suggested that TES has plenty of physical room for kids, but doesn't have enough teachers, noting that five teacher positions were eliminated in the fall. I asked what that meant for fall of 2021, which there was no answer. Just a comment about more information will be forthcoming. I have no intentions of sending my kids back to school before the general population has been vaccinated and certainly not before the adults in our household have even have been vaccinated. This whole year, we have practiced social distancing, mask wearing, minimizing and eliminating extra activities and travel. We haven't seen our out of state family in over a year. We go grocery shopping every two weeks we're making do with the times. My fourth grader even said it's ridiculous to send kids back before their teachers and parents are vaccinated. They don't feel safe doing so, and I don't blame them. Our choice is to continue the remote learning until the fall. The overwhelming concern I have is this fall. If there aren't enough teachers to teach the kids now, how will my kids be able to ever to return to the classroom? Considering the challenges, we've had an amazing experience with their teacher, Kelly Kavicki. She somehow manages to juggle both kindergarten and fourth grade simultaneously. I do not envy her position. However, both kids have grown attached to her and my kindergartner is just learning what it means to be a student. What kind of message does it send the kids that school is prioritizing some kids over others? That is not the message you're sending by prioritizing classroom in classroom learning, regardless of the loss of consistency and learning gains by remote learners. For the sake of the kids who have worked diligently this year to shift the routines to accommodate to remote learning, do not change the remote learning teaching assignments. The sacrifices we have made this past year have been enough. I realize there are kids who do not take remote learning seriously and I suspect they are some of the same who return to the classroom as a matter of requirement. Please do not punish the ones who have focused and worked throughout, throughout to make the hybrid model possible. We need stability for our children. I implore you, do not change the remote learning assignments to prioritize in-person learning. Regards, Julie Kibbe, Temple the resident and mom to two TES students. Excuse me. <laughs> okay, next we have a letter from Courtney and Carmine Imbriglio there from Templeton as well, I believe. Dear Narragansett School Committee, we would like to start this letter by thanking the NRSD staff. They are putting forth a, a yeoman's effort and doing a tremendous job in navigating and overcoming the many challenges of remote, hybrid, and concurrent teaching. We have three children in the district and we are so thankful for their warmth, kindness, and understanding. We are writing this letter to advocate for our remote students to continue the year with the dedicated remote teachers or have the option of a full in-person return on April 5th, 2021, in line with Commissioner Riley's guidance. With little consideration for the plans that have been made by districts and the upheaval that this could cause, Commissioner Riley released guidance for full in-person return, which has forced many schools into a tailspin. While we are happy for the families for whom these plans may be beneficial, some families are suffering. On March 12th, families received a letter from Dr. Casavan discussing the guidance and remote families received a survey. It appears that the remote teaching staff will be reassigned and remote students will be assigned to different classes. In the letter from Dr. Casavan, he wrote, students who are currently fully remote at any of our schools will be able to choose to return five days in person, return to five days in person instruction, but we put on a waiting list until we have the staff and space capacity for them to return. Originally, we thought it was a space issue at TES, but Dr. Casavan commented on Facebook that there was room but not enough staff. At the beginning of the year, we agreed to the remote option, but agreements go two ways. When we agreed, our understanding was that our children will be taught by a dedicated remote teacher. The terms of the agreement have changed and therefore the agreement should be null and void. We believe our children will feel singled out if forced to participate as remote students during sim simultaneous instruction. Furthermore, we question whether or not the school will be able to provide an equitable education. In his letter, Dr. Casavant quoted DESI guidance, which discusses how instructional delivery might change. 
The same document from Desi says parent guardians have the option to choose full or in-person or remote learning for their students. These options apply whether the students are currently in remote learning, hybrid or in-person learning. Just to be clear on this guidance, we call Desi. We spoke with Nathan Lemon who said the school could not, be, could not force students to stay home. The only time they can be waitlisted is if families decide after April 5th to switch from the remote model. Mr. Lemon also said that if a school does not follow guidelines and allow remote students to start full-time at the same time as hybrid students, then parents should file complaints and the school could face consequences. Obviously, we do not want this to happen. He did say that, the, that if this is not doable, Dr. Cassavant should be applying for a waiver. This year, the schools have certainly had to think outside the box. We are empathetic to the challenges being faced by administrators and staff. Our knowledge of school budgets is limited, but we are hoping you consider the following suggestions. Number one, keeping the remote kids together and hire a long-term substitute through the end of the year. We believe Dr. Cassavant was able to hire a long-term sub with some of the stimulus money in the past. Perhaps that could be an option. Number two, have an administrator cover one or two classes through the remainder of the year. What better way to gain teacher perspective? It would certainly be a powerful experience. Number three, look into using ESSER one and two funds, which is mentioned in the guidance as a way for districts to plan to plan immediate needs. Sorry. We love and support our schools, but we must advocate what is best for our children. We're asking the Narragansett Regional School Committee to support the continuation of the current remote model or give remote students the option to return in full person instruction starting April 5th. Thank you, Courtney and Carmine and Briglio. Two more. This one is from Kayla Richard of Templeton. She's a parent of a TES student. Um, Hello, I am writing because I am concerned about my child's teacher potentially changing. I understand the district needs to make changes due to guidelines. I just wish they keep in mind classes who have already gone through, te through teachers this year. My kindergarten started with the year, I'm sorry, my kindergarten started the year with Miss Wida, had a long-term sub and now has Miss Diaz. This is her first experience with school and is already on her third teacher. This year has been tough on everyone, but another teacher change would be a huge hurdle for us during an already very challenging first year. Thank you, Kayla Richard. And our last uh, public input is from Alyssa Moore. She's a uh, TES parent of, I believe, two students. Um, and she asks, will the extended daycare program be available at the elementary school? Uh, will it begin on April 5th? Will information be available for parents and guardians? Thank you, Alyssa Moore, kindergarten parent. Great, thank you, Susan, for reading all of those. Um, there is one other public comment that came in. Um, Mr. Thomas Re Reynolds from Templeton um, mentioned in the chat uh, box that he had sent an email um, just probably just prior to our meeting starting and he would like his comments read. I had him send them to me. So I'll go ahead and give you a break and go ahead and read his comments. Okay. So this says, dear members of the Narragansett Regional School Committee. My name is Dr. Thomas Reynolds and I live at 68 Laurelville, Laurel View Road here in Templeton. It's been brought to my attention that the number of faculty members in the music program in the Narragansett Regional School District is being cut from four individuals to three. I've spent 33 years as a music educator in the public schools, and I'm committed to advocating for the importance of public school music. While I serve as the coordinator of student teaching and music education at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, I am also the president of the Lowell Mason House in Medfield, Massachusetts, restoring the birthplace of Lowell Mason, America's first public school music supervisor and the Boston Public Schools in 1833. Of course, Lowell Mason was friends with Horace Mann and was instrumental with the development of public schools across Massachusetts, including education programs at Bridgewater State and Westfield State Universities. Lowell Mason's first job as a music educator was actually in Athol, where he taught both vocal and instrumental music. While I do not have any children in the Narragansett Regional School District, I am very aware of the excellent work that is being done by the music educators in the district. In the 18 years in which I have been a resident of Templeton, I have always had the gut feeling that while music is supported in this district, I've always felt that the program struggled over the years having enough financial resources to develop an exemplary 
music program that covers a comprehensive approach to music education with vocal and instrumental performance ensembles, general music, music theory and composition, and music offerings that help the schools address diversity and equity issues, topics that are especially important in 2021. While there are many extra musical benefits that result in the study of music relative to increased brain development for children, resulting in improved academic performance, the learning of music for music's sake is still the most important reason for having it in our schools, especially now with the contributions that music making to students in the social emotional learning, given the devastating things that our students have gone through in this recent pandemic. As a music slash fine arts director in Harvard in the Harvard Mass, I was always proud that we had a school with the highest MCAS scores in Massachusetts with a very high percentage of all students involved in music making in our schools, especially at the Bromfield School. I'm still mystified why a school system would want to cut back music at a time when the research clearly shows that a robust music education program contributes positively to the overall academic growth and performance of its students. Your music faculty members are truly outstanding. A school's resources not only encompass your physical plant and material educational resources, but also the quality of your human resources. I trust sending music student teachers to the Narragansett Regional School District because of the confidence that I have in the staff here in the quality and the professionalism of their work. I'd be happy to further work with anyone in the school district if I can be of any assistance. I beg you to please reconsider the downsizing of your public school music program here in Templeton and Phillipson. Sincerely, Thomas E. Reynolds. So thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Um, your comments have gone on public record and I appreciate you reaching out via the chat screen um, to make us aware of those. Okay. So that was a lot of public comment. I think we're going to address most of those topics this evening. So rather than comment on them here, um, I'm going to allow us to continue with the agenda and we can address some of these uh, items that came up um, as part of our other agenda items. Because as I said, I believe they will all be covered there. Um, I'm not seeing any other comments or public comment. I did just want to also mention uh, Dawn Benoit said that she tuned in just in time to hear such great positive news from Ms. Bennett, um, reflecting Abby's uh, comments for the student representatives. And I wanted to make note of that. Um, and uh, she also just said very, very compelling commentary on music. Um, and Mr. Reynolds just thanked us again for reading it and uh, appreciate it very much for reading his comments. So with that said, I'm gonna move on to our next agenda item, which is, let's see. Where did I go? The NDEA, I believe. Did I skip you over first? I can't, I don't know. I'm, no, I'm, you all, I'm all out of order here, but Eric, I'm going to turn it over to you for the NDEA. And Lisa, Thank well. you. sorry. Thank you. And, and yeah, Lisa's here, of course, and it's good to see you all. Uh, it's been a couple of months since I've been in, but I've been tuning in either on YouTube. And of course, Lisa updates the board uh, every time we have our meeting. Um, and I am here tonight because the music director, um, the music department head, Kara Kowalczyk, has asked me to read a letter on behalf of our teachers. Um, you know, it, it, this has changed a lot, the COVID situation. And although we knew why Dr. Kasvet had to move Ms. McKeon to pre-K, temporary, we'll get that program going as soon as we can get back. Um, because staff is so razor thin right now. Um, and then when this came out that uh, we might be losing this position or we'll be losing this position next year, that, that further depletes the music department's ability to generate a program from the very young up, including things like ensemble and band and chorus. So uh, this is a letter from Kara Kowalczyk who is our music and fine arts department chair. Uh, dear school committee, we are asking that you keep these positions in the music department intact and not move forward with the plan to eliminate a music position at the high school. While we have operated with one music faculty member at the high school before, and even, uh, thanks to Jody Clapp, kind of splitting into two there, even a partial faculty member one year, we have always had two music positions in the middle to keep that music program fairly healthy. The proposed change would leave just one faculty in each of the three schools, which would effectively dismantle band and chorus in just a couple of years. Um, she's included in her uh, Google Doc letter that I gave to the school committee, a series of scenarios, the work she put into this. 
she did a series of scenarios and what the different scenarios uh, ABC um, would do if rearranged in certain ways. So you can see she has thought pretty deeply about what the um, impact would be. The interest in music, practice, dedication, enthusiasm, the program must be kept year to year or we're at risk of losing our students. Ensemble students are not the only ones who stand to lose based on this decision. Students who might not otherwise have the opportunity to take music classes will miss out simply due to lack of space in our faculty schedule. It is therefore no question that we will lose students to this deficit. We also stand to lose vitality, school spirit, and for many students, the reason they look forward to school. Um, music and art classes are literally a win-win situation for both students and the school itself. We cannot pretend as a district that we are invested in the social emotional learning of our students while simultaneously winning away at our music program to essentially nothing. Our program has already suffered the consequences of some previous changes outlined in Ann Lyons letter and the program cannot withstand the faculty cut and keep operating in a way that will ensure uh, a healthy music program, especially one that is long-term. Uh, please do not dismantle a program that is so important to the vitality of Narragansett and to all the students who deserve the best and all encompassing education. It is certainly not worth the salary of one faculty. And I know because Dr. Cassavan and I at this point in the pandemic speak pretty much daily, he has before been able to squeeze a dime out of a nickel. I don't know how he's always able to do it, uh, help of grants or some really creative thinking. And if there's any way that the school committee and Dr. Cassavant can figure out a way to, to keep that program as robust as possible, um, we're, we're behind it 100%. Um, that's all I share, I had to share. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Lisa, did you have any, anything you wanna say? Um, just on a positive note, having the kids back full days has been wonderful. Um, I think all the teachers will agree that just having them, you know, until 1215 or it just wasn't enough time. Um, the kids seem happier. The teachers seem happier. Um, I know at TES lunch is going very well. I have a lunch duty every day and just seeing the kids in the cafeteria is just make, makes me feel somewhat normal, like things are coming back. So hopefully as we move forward, it'll get more and more, you know, back to, back to some sort of normalcy for these kids and teachers. But um, it's great. It's great having them in school all day long. And the other thing was the vaccination. Most most of the most of the staff now at all buildings have been vaccinated. And I want to thank the um, Haywood Hospital for for that help. Um, you know, here we were thinking we'd be hanging on a thread for a, a lot longer, and it ended up coming through. And I think from start to finish, within two weeks' time, they came in. They got everyone vaccinated for the first shot, and just the energy. I wasn't there. I wasn't there the day that they went on the Saturday. Um, but it sounds I was, like I was. Uh, yeah, I was there this past Saturday at the PACC and there were teachers of course from Narragansett um, and then Gardner teachers started coming in, Ash West, um, all our local districts and there was just a, a almost um, a, a, like a party atmosphere, a celebratory atmosphere. There was a lot of nervous energy but there was just like people were applauding each other when their 15 minute timer would go off. Um, it was almost surreal because we know we were in the middle of this sort of medical emergency, but we were also in the middle of this like deeply historical moment, like the polio vaccine. And was it 1954? Like we knew we were in this moment. And I'll just share this real quickly. I share it with the superintendent. We're all sitting there and you know, everyone's waiting uh, to see if there's a reaction in their arm. There's teachers from all these different districts, these nurses and doctors, and they're working really quickly. And poor Sue Weed is sitting right up against the speaker that they're playing music through and it's really <laughs> loud. You can see she's sort of like, can someone turn this down? And, and then Aerosmith's Dude Looks Like a Lady comes on and her face and every, everybody around her just started laughing hysterically. Um, so that, and so I just want to say to everybody that was involved, Dr. Katsavant, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I, on behalf of my family, um, I have a lot of pre-existing conditions and we've been, you know, nervous. Um, and I know all the teachers felt just heartfelt thanks that you were able to 
do whatever you could do to get this done. We appreciate it very much. So, they were so organized. I mean, they, they just, people just go in and in and out so, so quickly. It was just impressive. And everyone was so kind and, you know, friendly, just a great, great. Now it's for us to think about that we're moving forward. We're moving in the right direction. Great, thank you. Thank you both Eric and Lisa and Eric for sharing the information from um, the, the music staff uh, at, at the, the school and, uh, and Lisa welcome. sharing, um, I, I, I think, yes, a huge shout out to Haywood and the coordination and the effort that it took. And, um, you know, just thinking about how this whole thing rolled out, how we thought we, you know, we had so many shots and then, the number went, but all of a sudden they were getting everyone in and it really um, is, is wonderful to know that our teachers have all uh, taken advantage and, you know, we'll be able to get back in the classrooms. And I, I assume there was a collective sigh of relief for many um, as that's taking place. So yeah. um, as I said, a great big shout out to, to Haywood for coordinating that effort for us. So thank you. Um, so we're gonna move on to our next um, item, which is just a quick update um, on FY21 budget status update. And this really just revolves around things at the state level. I, and as far as I know, there's really nothing new to report. I know there's some good revenue numbers that came in um, for sales tax and whatnot in the month of February. Um, so, you know, the state, I think, is for FY21, we are pretty stable. I don't think they'll be looking to come back with any last minute, you know, 9C cuts that you usually hear about. I don't know, Dr. Kazavant, if you've, you've, same, if you've heard anything no, different. No, FY21, you know, is pretty much, you know, on, on approach. Um, we're just trying to, you know, we're just kind of wrapping up at the state level in terms of circuit breaker, et cetera, et cetera, that type of stuff. So um, we're, we're going to, we're going to be all set for uh, for for 21. There's this. Right. There'll be no surprises. No one seems to think that. Great, great. Um, FY 22 budget update status. When we last met, we had certified our FY 22 budget um, with the caveat that we needed to provide the assessment numbers to the towns of Templeton and Phillipston, but also let them know that they were required to vote at the select board level um, on whether or not they wanted to take advantage of the provision to utilize some of our ESSER II funding to offset the increase in their minimum local contributions for FY21. Um, they were advised uh, that this would be a one-time thing, that they would be on the hook for making up that gap the following year, plus any additional assessment that might come their way. So I know that that information went out, um, that both select boards um, did meet. I watched the Templeton, um, meeting. So I, I saw their actual vote. So I know that happened. Um, and then I, I believe, uh, Anne-Marie, you mentioned that you did receive the letter from Phillips. And I was just wondering, have we received the physical letter from Templeton at this point? I know they were sending them out. Yes, we've received both letters. Excellent. So with that being said, one of the things that we needed to do was go ahead and recertify our budget to acknowledge the fact that the assessments to the towns would be lowered by the amounts that are covered by these ESSER II funds. So I'm going to go through the whole set of motions again so that we can recertify our budget and do just that. Um, I would like to just make a public statement with the fact that we're really, um, you know, we're making these motions. The budget has not been finalized, obviously, at the state level yet that this was what was printed as the plan from the governor. This needs to, the budget obviously needs to go through the House and the Senate and through all subcommittees and resolution committees um, to go to the governor's desk for signature. Um, we always base our initial certification on what the governor sends out. So that is what our assumptions are here. And I just wanted to make that statement publicly um, in case things change down the line. So that is on record that we are going with what we know today. So with that being said, um, I'm going to just go to this rule of necessity. If there is a, if we're going to need to vote on a line item that someone has a conflict because they may participate maybe in a retiree health plan or any other item, um, and we couldn't have enough of a quorum to vote on a budget, we would invoke the rule of necessity. We will not need to do that this evening because when you vote on a budget as a whole, um, this does not apply. 
So um, we should be okay, but if that needed to come up, we would be able to invoke that rule. So our first motion would be to motion uh, that the Narragansett Regional School District School Committee vote and certify the amount of $20,057,186 for the FY22 budget. So I would entertain a motion as such. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Mason. Do I have a second? Second. And I have a second by Mrs. Kojal. Any questions or comments? As you notice, it is the same number that we certified the last time, so that did not change. Um, we'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Marks? Yes. <laughs> Mrs. Chartier? Yes. Mrs. Robichaud? Yes. Mrs. Matson? Yes. Mrs. Kojal? Yes. Mrs. Trifolo? Yes. Mr. Mason? Aye. And Mrs. Hughes says yes, so that is unanimous. Next, we need to vote the estimated receipts. And we, I would entertain a motion that the Narragansett Regional School District School Committee vote the estimated receipts of $11,264,045 for fiscal year 22, which is based on $9,988,464,000 of Chapter 70 funds as calculated from the governor's budget of January 25th, 27th, 2021, $35,532 of charter school reimbursements from the cherry sheet estimates of January 27th, 2021, $325,217 of Chapter 71 Special Regional Transportation from the Cherry Sheet Estimates of January 27th, 2021. $480,000 of Certified Excess and Deficiency Funds, $245,000 of Medicaid Receipts, and $189,832 of ESSER II funds for the uh, MLC offsets. I would entertain a motion as such. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Marks. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second by Mrs. Trifolo. Any questions or comments? And what I will note here is that we've now included the um, minimum contribution offset uh, from the ESSER II grant in this estimated receipt number. Okay, seeing no questions or comments, Mr. Marks? Yes. Mrs. Chartier? Yes. Mrs. Robichaud? Yes. Mrs. Matson? Yes. Mrs. Kojal? Yes. Mrs. Trifolo? Yes. Mr. Mason? Aye. And Mrs. Hughes says yes. That was unanimous. The next vote is for the assessment to the town of Templeton. So I would entertain a motion that the Narragansett Regional School District School Committee vote the assessment to Templeton in the amount of $7,143,837 for fiscal 2022, which includes the application of $139,403 of ESSER II funds to offset the MLC increase for fiscal year 22. I would entertain a motion as such. So moved. I have a motion for Mrs. Trifolo. Do I have a second? Second. And I have a second from Mrs. Kojal. Do I have uh, any questions or comments on that? Seeing none, we will do roll call. Mr. Marks? Yes. Mrs. Chartier? Yes. Mrs. Robichaud? Yes. Mrs. Matson? Yes. Mrs. Kojal? Yes. Mrs. Trifolo? Yes. Mr. Mason? Aye. And Mrs. Hughes says yes, so that was unanimous. And the last motion would be that we motion that the Narragansett Regional School District School Committee vote the assessment to Phillipston in the amount of $1,649,304 for fiscal year 22, which includes the application of $50,429 of ESSER II funds to offset the MLC increase for FY22. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion, I'll say Rayanne, do I have a second? Second. And I have a second for Mr. Marks. Do I have any questions or comments on that? Seeing none, we will do roll call. Mr. Marks? Yes. Mrs. Chartier? Yes. Mrs. Robichaud? Yes. Mrs. Matson? Yes. Mrs. Kojal? Yes. Mrs. Trifolo? Yes. Mr. Mason? Aye. 
And Mrs. Hughes says yes, so that is unanimous. So we have now just recertified our FY22 budget with the revised assessments that apply the uh, ESSER two funds to the minimum local contribution. So we'll ask the treasurer to send out the new uh, information to both towns. Um, and I'm, I would assume we would probably wanna be clear of that amount of the ESSER two money so that, uh, they, that we've got it in writing of what that amount is so there's no surprise. Um, as to what the amount would be that they'll have on their books for next year that they have to make up. Um, I think it's appropriate at this point, just because we're talking about FY22, to just address some of the public input. Um, we received a lot of commentary on uh, the music program. We had, uh, you know, a lot of thought went into the FY22 budget, um, and we appreciate hearing from the public the questions, comments, and concerns. Um, about the, uh, the change to the staffing for the music department. What I think I would like to ask is if Dr. Kazavant, if you could um, maybe take a look at what the information is that we've just received. Um, and maybe we could take this up first at the academic administrative committee, subcommittee meeting. Um, is that okay, Mrs. Trifolo, since that's your subcommittee? Yes. Okay, and if we could have a further discussion because I, I think that there's um, a lot of good points that were made. I think that we've also been able to put some things in place that may satisfy some of the questions and comments, but I think it would be nice to discuss those and be able to respond uh, holistically to the questions and comments and see what we, we may uh, or may not be able to do based upon where we stand for FY22, um, if that would be okay with you, Dr. Kazavit? Absolutely. Okay. All right. And again, thank you to everybody who did send in some, uh, you know, comments and questions, concerns on that. Um, we will look at it and see, you know, if we are able to do anything. Um, we understand the importance of our music and fine arts program. And, uh, you know, we'll see what we can do about that. So thank you, everyone, for those, those that public input. Um, also, just as a note, under the correspondence section of our agenda, there were a couple other um, uh, input that did come in that did not want to be necessarily read as public input. So those two letters are under the correspondence section are, and are available to, to be reviewed. Um, the committee has already received them, but if anyone in the public wanted to see, to see them as well, they are out there to be looked at. So. Okay, so with that being said, next up is the business manager's report. Ms. Geister, I will turn this over to you. Um, there's there's not really anything new to report tonight. We're just working on starting to wind things down, starting to make sure that all of our encumbrances are accurate, that we have everything that we are anticipating spending encumbered so that there's no surprises with straight invoices at the end of the year. No new grants, just spending them down. So a lot of them end on June 30th. Most of them don't have a rollover provision. So they're mostly salaries this year anyways. So those are kind of taking care of themselves as we move along. Anyone have any questions or comments for Ms. Geister on uh, the financials as they've been presented so far? I don't see any. Um, I know we will have to talk soon about any line item adjustments. So I know once you start firming up some of those encumbrances and whatnot, um, we can talk about that. Um, I did see just for the record that um, I think the rural schools grant, um, the information has started to come out. Um, so that's something I believe we're eligible for. So maybe for our next meeting, we can talk yeah. a little bit about that um, because I know they like to release numbers and never tell us about how we can spend it. Um, so once we, we only have a couple of months to do it. Exactly. Um, and I know that we are anticipating some funds from the, the, the latest um, stimulus package that went through. I had heard, you know, 2.4 times the amount of what we just got. Um, then I heard, oh, well, that's not right. Maybe it's more, maybe it's less. So who knows? Uh, we're waiting for those. I did see they just released the municipality relief. Um, and I believe that Templeton is slated, I think it was like $2.3 million and Phillipston's getting half a million dollars or something like that. Again, I'm not sure what the stipulations are for the, for the municipal relief. I'm not sure if that contains any of monies that should, should go to education, um, although that should have been a separate fund. So I guess we have a lot to learn for our next meeting. Okay, 
Um, next up, big topic tonight, our COVID-19 updates. We've got a whole host of things to, um, to go over. Um, I'm just gonna give a quick um, overview of a couple things so we can get into the, the meat of what we need to talk about tonight, which is reopening. Um, Abby did very well, sports is up and going. Um, I know I'm a football mom, so they start the 27th, their first game at Gardner they play. Very excited about that. I know winter, winter track is up and running. Uh, spring sports is getting ready, so that's awesome. Um, we've, we've talked to death about some of the other things. I knew new guidance came out on MCAS and they pushed the dates back. I believe we talked about that the last meeting. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kazavant to talk through what the, um, the, the commissioner's uh, declaration of April 5th means and uh, how we as a district are going to respond. So all yours. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. So, yes, it has been a, uh, a very interesting uh, couple of weeks, uh, to say the least. So um, I want to just kind of just take a step back and, and talk a little bit about the guidance. So um, in terms of how the guidance came out at first, it was, you know, really word of mouth um, from the commissioner. And then we then we actually received um you know, it in writing. So there was certainly at times a little bit of, um, let's just say, I think that there was certainly times when not a lot of us knew, and I'm talking about superintendents, mind you, um, who really understood the, you know, the, the rules of the road. So what I've, what I've done, and this is not a long PowerPoint at all, um, it'll be something that we'll post, but I wanted to kind of bring us back to see how we actually got here. So if you remember, and who couldn't forget, Back in January, we had to, um, in essence, uh, January, uh, pardon me, January, July and August, we had to come up with three plans. Um, ESSER 1 uh, just had been released. We had to explain how we were going to uh, do things. Could we come back full? Um, if not, how would we go uh, hybrid? And we also had to come up with a remote plan. So when, when we were tasked with uh, making that happen, that's what we did. So in our plan, we knew at the elementary level, for example, given the three feet um, rule, which is still in effect, and of course, um, lunch being at six feet, we identified at that point in time that we would need 12 additional teachers. So, and I'll get into that in a bit. So we did talk about that a little bit, and then we kind of moved on to um, hybrid. So um, last month, uh, the commissioner uh, through, uh, through the to the board, the board of education, they um, put through through regulation um, that all students will return. I think I'm, you know, we're obviously I'm I'm stating the obvious at this point. But as we as we started, don't forget we did lay off a lot of positions. Um, why does that count, and why does that matter now? Well, when I get into um, how many positions we would need, if we had these positions, we wouldn't need so many. Um, and of course, the monies, you know, could have been allocated differently, but um, right in the, the actual configuration per grade um, at uh, TES are four teachers, right, per grade. That's important to remember. Although we have more bodies now, that's, that is clearly because of COVID. These cuts were made, um, and these decisions were made pre-COVID, Okay. So where do we begin? So obviously in March 13th, the state shut down all the schools. Uh, we went full remote not to return, at least for that school year. As I said, we uh, really followed the DESE um, blueprint. We sent out surveys. I had a, a, a community forum that really had two of them in the same day, one roughly in the morning, one in the afternoon to, to discuss uh, how our plans moving forward. Um, and how staffing and, and PPE and all those type of things would look. So in September of, on September 14th, we, we opened um, AB cohort hybrid um, at the three foot, uh, which again, I've, I've stated this many, many times. We were one of the only a few districts K-12 that opened up um, in the three foot uh, configuration. So how do we plan for the, uh, for the high school and middle school at that time? Well, at that moment or the beginning of the school year, we had 372 uh, students enrolled in the middle school. And we had 428 um, enrolled 
um, at the high school. That number went down a lot because of homeschool. And we've talked about what that does to when you go homeschool, you actually unenroll. I mean, those numbers go down. We knew that we had to distance at three feet. We spoke to that. But basically, depending on the room, uh, you know, we were anywhere between 11 and 17 students um, at the middle and high school level, given the guidance at the time in terms of how seats were positioned, middle of the desk to middle of the desk, that's changed a little bit to edge of seat to edge of seat. But again, um, in essence, this is where we were at. We did not have the classroom capacity. So that's why we went with the AB cohort model, um, which was approved by the state. Sorry, guys, I'm just gonna, okay. So what's next? Well, to kind of give you an up, you know, to, to kind of put this in focus, initially we had 86 of uh, uh, students, families, choose a fully remote model from the high school and 15 were brought back throughout the year. Initially, 72 students chose full remote um, at the middle school and we brought back three at that time uh, throughout the year. As of today, which is the 17th, uh, middle school has a list of 56 students who want to return um, and they and want to return full person and the high school has 24 students who want to return uh, to, full in, uh, to full in person instruction. So given all that, um, we can do that. It's gonna make some changes. It's gonna, you know, lunch is our biggest issue. Um, the gym at the middle school will, is really one large cafeteria, uh, so to speak, uh, as well as our large and small cafeterias. We've had to really remove every piece of furniture, as many pieces of furniture that we, um, that we had in the room just to put the max allowed into the classrooms, okay, depending on the measurements. Now, all this is, you know, we've, we've already gone through all the HVAC, you know, uh, you know, maintenance that we've done. So in, in essence, the middle and the high school, we believe that the high school is absolutely has plenty of has the staff and the space. The middle school, eventually, we will run out of both. Um, there's only really a couple of, I won't even call them classrooms because they're not, um, rooms available that we could expand to one, if we, you know, and two, it would depend on the number of staff that we would need. So, but as of right this minute, we could take, we could take these kids back um, at the three foot chair to chair. Um, but we're, we're very close in the middle school in terms of available space. The high school, we do have the space um, and we wouldn't, I don't think we'd, we would not have a problem in terms of returning those folks. All right. I'm starting obviously with the middle and high school because Folks have focused mostly on the, on the elementary, but uh, again, uh, on or about uh, the week of the 26th of April, um, as you've heard, the middle school will return um, to full in person. Um, we, are, we're, we are going to have to return the high school as well um, at the same time, quite frankly, because they are joined. Uh, they, we bus the same, you know, we, have, we share teachers to have two completely separate schedules um, and they're very different, of course, would be uh, impossible. Um, so we, you know, we're make, we have certainly decided that if, if the state is mandating that the middle school come back for us, the high school will have to come back at the same time in order for us to, um, in order for us to operate, um, quite frankly. So TES, so I'm gonna go back in history a little bit because I have to. Um, which ties into a lot of conversations. Uh, again, we talked about the number of teachers that were cut. So what's critical to understand that the issue that we have at the elementary school is based on the number of students that we would have pre-COVID um, in each classroom. So, you know, uh, during my budget presentation, if the folks who are homeschooled that literally went homeschool in September, um, you know, if they came back and plus all the remote, you know, we'd have anywhere between uh, 25, uh, the second grade would have 30, grade three would have 28, and grade four would have 28 kids, give or take, right? Because you don't know how many kids are going to come back. But if those kids who were assigned, say, J J uh, July 1, if they were in person, if they were here, those are the class sizes that we, we would have. The problem is now I have to then divide up each class in order to make up, right, or to actually provide the right distancing between uh, the students. So I, make, I wanna make sure that I say that because as we get into this, it does matter where you start, how many teachers or how many, uh, 
how many kids you have per classroom per grade. So obviously when we start talking about the distance, the distancing has always been three feet. Our biggest issue when we start talking about this is that we have tables. We don't have desks at the, uh, at the elementary school. Um, and if we had 450 desks, give or take, you know, you, you could argue that that would be a lot easier to do, um, but we don't. We don't have 450 desks, we have tables. So we have uh, plexiglass dividers and we have all of those things um, that to keep everyone, of course, safe and distance and of course, mask wearing, et cetera. But in terms of the rooms, um, the kindergarten, which has the largest rooms and they generally are the smallest um, the students, we can fit about 18 uh, given, given those classrooms. Grades one, about 14. Grades two, three, and four, we get up and around 15, 16 students, kids get bigger. You know, it's, it's a spacing issue and there's only so many things that you can take out of the classroom, which we have absolutely taken out. We did not have this, we did not have the staff capacity, right? So that's why we went to the A and B cohort model because the space is not ultimately a problem. It's not, remember, we have five classrooms per grade. We only have four teachers per grade. And then we have a lot of other rooms, whether it be the library, it be the makerspace room, special education classroom. I mean, we have the classrooms, it's, it's about the staff. And that was our, um, you know, what, what drove us to go to A and B um, in the very beginning. So what's next? Well, I'm gonna tell you that this, when, as we're seeing these numbers roll in to Templeton Elementary, so initially we had 122 students choose for remote. We'd already had brought back 27. Um, through the, through the wait list that we had. Um, and the question obviously became, how are we going to bring back all students from in, uh, for in-person instruction? Well, so again, remember the number 12 teachers, that's above and beyond the number of teachers that we already have at Templeton Elementary School, okay? So that's 12 plus. So what did we do? Well, from, and you can go back into this, but we have been, um, and, and we were lucky. We, we did get uh, folks to apply. Uh, we sent out many requests for teachers. You know, we put on school spring, we put in the newspaper, we put on Facebook, we put all those places. Well, you know, we certainly didn't get the number of teachers that we needed um, to, uh, to go, to stay in person the entire time. And we still have not received those teachers. The, the, we've put out multiple ads and we still have not received them. So we had to do this. We have to take the three remote teachers. This is what folks do know, right? The, most of the letters are about, well, look, you got three remote teachers. I'm gonna have to bring them in into the building. They're actually gonna have to be classroom teachers and they're gonna have to be assigned to a grade, which I'll get to. Our math coach, our two intervention teachers and our three unified arts teachers are also gonna have to be um, put into the the uh, into classroom as classroom teachers. Okay. Now that's a problem because if you read down a couple other bullets, if you don't have your unified art teachers and they're classroom teachers, then we cannot rotate the schedule. We can't do what it takes because teachers need prep, they need lunch, etc. So in order to do just get them into the building for the required amount of time, um, we're going to have to start we're gonna to have to change the time of the elementary school, TES. So we're gonna to have to start, kids would start their day at 9 a.m., but they would, they would go home the same time. Um, what that'll allow is the teachers will come in their regular time, that will be their, uh, their, their prep time, um, and then basically teach the remainder of the day to the end of the day in order to um, accommodate, uh, obviously, all the students back full time and to make sure that we're in compliance. There will be no unified arts classes. Um, in order to be able to do that, as I was explaining, is that, um, and I'll get to this in the next section, so is that as many teachers as you have, classroom teachers, you need almost, not teacher to teacher, but you need almost as many unified arts teachers. If you have six teachers and their prep time is at, say, 10, I, I don't, we'll make up a time, then they have to go somewhere to do that. And so there has to be a place to go. So We've been able to do that through PE, art, um, health, um, music, you know, uh, but that is not going to be possible because now they're all going to have to be reassigned as classroom teachers. Okay, so 
the big the big question becomes well who's my who's my child going to have who's you know what's going to happen here so before i get into all of that i want to talk about and hopefully i don't okay good all right so this is how the grades are going to break down kindergarten will have five teachers and the rest will have to have six based on number total number of kids um and again i don't have to read all these num names but you know you know, grade one, Ms. Moran, Ms. Lynch, Ms. O'Connell, Ms. Smith, Ms. Voss, and Ms. Langan. Grade two, Caruth, Cullen, Ethier, Jilson, Chenoweth, and Ms. Caps. Um, grade three, Ms. LeClerc, Cormier, Reese, Qualters, Laurie, and Hazelton. Uh, grade four, Ms. Woodrow, Skavich, Kirby, Sherwood, Parker, um, and Kavicki. So what does that mean? So as people have said tonight through their letters and through emails and through a bunch, and this is why it was very tight lift and said, you're, go you're just going to have to wait um, to, you know, not say it that way, but there'll be more information based on, you know, through the, um, through the committee um, at the committee meeting is that, that how, how this is going to work or going to need to work is that, for example, uh, let me use, well, Mrs. Voss is a great example. So if you have, if you're a full remote child right now, and you're in the first and second grade, Okay, Miss Voss, I just read, is going to be a first grade classroom teacher. So in that in that situation, the first graders that were with her, remote or otherwise, are going to uh, be able to, for the most part, put them in right in her classroom. Okay, so those children with the first graders currently will have Miss Voss. Right, the second graders will not, and they're going to have to be they're going to have to be, you know, uh, reassigned to a teacher. Okay. So that's, I could go down the line, right? So Mrs. Kavicki had kindergarten and fourth grade. Well, Mrs. Kavicki is going to be assigned to the fourth grade. So using the same example, Ms. Kavicki, right, is going to have those fourth grade kids, right, in person, right? They're going to be there. Um, so, and, but the kindergarten students who had Mrs. Kavicki will not because we only have three full remote teachers at this point in time, right? And I I'm, and I'm need to expand the number of teachers I have just to get them into the building, okay? Just to get them to start, uh, you know, live in person. So the, the one thing that I wanna make sure that, that, that is clearly, and I'm gonna get to these clarifications, okay, in a minute, but I don't wanna get there too soon because people will read through all the clarifications, is that no matter what, that whatever whatever the schedule that Ms. Voss, Ms. Kavicki, and Ms. Lori, oh, by the way, Ms. Lori had the third grade, sorry. I, I missed out on Ms. Lori. Um, what, however they set up their full remote days, okay, those are going to change, absolutely. They can stay full remote, we all know this. If, it, as a, if a parent just, you know, makes the decision to keep them fully remote, that is absolutely okay. The state has come out and said that multiple times. I have said that multiple times. The district itself cannot have a full remote model, you know, as part of its model. In other words, we can't do what we're doing now with our A and B. Remember, we can't have kids who are um, remote um, and count if that's part of our actual uh, plan. Okay, so I don't know what that schedule is going to look like. I don't know the change changes, but it's going to change for for certain. Okay, so who is my teacher going to have? That is going to be the very next biggest question, I guarantee, if not the biggest question. With few exceptions, current full remote students with a full remote teacher, all right? So they'll have that teacher, okay? But it'll, probably, it'll be in person, right? In grades one, three, and four will remain with their remote teacher, all right? Kindergarten and grade two will have new teachers. So I'm gonna, re you know, I think I read that kind of, uh, kind of quirky. In grades one, three, and four, they, they will remain with their remote teacher. All right, kindergarten in grade two will have completely new teachers, okay? Class lists will be ready by next week because again, numbers are still coming in, right? So someone is bound to ask, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. How in the world are we gonna do this with, if my child stays full remote, how is, you know, and you say that Mrs. Voss, you know, is gonna, you know, have that child. Well, we're, we're trying to work that out, right? Because Ms. Voss may very well be, the teacher and the other others on the, on the computer, just like this, but she'll have 11 of her first graders, right? Let's say I'm picking up a number. I don't know. 
and whoever stay remote might very well be the, you know, learning remotely as we do now. So asynchronous learning, a teacher teaching kids both in front of them, okay, and virtually, which we, which we do throughout this district. Um, and the elementary were the only group that had ele uh, re full remote teachers dedicated to kids who were full remote, okay? The class list will be ready next week, uh, if I didn't already say that. Um, if not sooner, because we have to, you know, we have to get a, there's a lot of information that we're going to have to um, digest and then, and then react to. So the clarifiers, NRSD will bring all students back to full in-person instruction whose families want to do so. That is the rule. I want to talk about the wait list in a second here, but after April, per DESE guidance, additional students wanting to return may be placed on the wait list. Ms. Embryo, uh, and I'm sure was it Mrs. Embryo? I think brought up the fact that it's it says that, and that's what the what Desi had also said in um, the conflict uh, CRS. But what what I meant to do was I was going to hopefully put folks on wait list in order to like get folks to kind of go back to a regular schedule, keep it you know with Unified Arts. That obviously is going to fall um, on or it's going to fail on on two counts. One, I can't wait. So uh, pardon me, April 5th is April 5th. That's when, that's when elementary students are coming back, period. So in two, um, you know, the, the state says, you can't wait, Castleman. You, you've got you've to move with what you have today. And that's exactly what I have today. We have, we refreshed, as they call it, the posting for elementary teachers. Again, okay. Um, you know, what does that mean? I don't know. I mean, will I change up teachers? No, they will hopefully be unified arts teachers. If you remember, we talked about posting unified arts teachers a while ago. So <clears throat> remote learners, uh, remote learning time does count for families that choose for their children to stay remote this year. Again, if you as a family choose to stay remote, you're all, everything is all set, fine. It's your decision to make, absolutely. I wanna just keep saying that over and over again, okay? Um, remote learning time does not count for districts choosing to stay remote um, in mass. Some districts have been full remote all year. So there's a bunch of, and that's where the waiver question comes up, right? So if you don't think that you can um, somehow satisfy the, uh, the mandate to come back full time, you're going to have to apply for a waiver with the state. We have already been told straight out that very, very few, if any waivers will be granted if you have already been in, in hybrid. Those kind of waivers are really for districts that had a tremendous amount of difficulty just getting out of, um, you know, out of full remote. A B cohort hybrid models, which we um, which we have currently right now, um, does not count for elementary students after April fifth, and or for the middle school students after April twenty six. We say the twenty six because the state put the twenty eighth as a start date. I, I'm not sure why we would want to start on a Wednesday, quite frankly especially as we're trying to get everything kind of moving forward, you know, it'd be, you know, it's certainly my, my intention to start both on the 26th. I, I don't, I'm not quite sure why the 28th was such a, was such a pitiful date. Um, and again, uh, just to kind of, uh, kind of reiterate, the NRSD will bring middle school and high school back on April 26th. So I just wanted to make sure I said that kind of almost twice to kind of give folks a kind of a heads up as we go forward. So we received a lot of questions, um, obviously the letters as well, but you know, can you hire long-term substitutes uh, to prevent students needing to change teachers? We have posted for teachers and substitutes several times this year and have not had any qualified candidates or very, very few. I will give you an example. We had, um, not COVID related, we had some teachers out at the middle school, okay? Um, the, the, the billing principal, um, and the, the secretary called 32 substitutes on the list. Not one person either responded or could do it. So my, my point is that we're trying, we put out, you know, we're, we're, we're constantly trying. Um, so have we posted? Yes. But I have to tell you that if we got three teachers in right now, that would just be part of the, um, just getting the back the schedule uh, back to, 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 uh, to normal, meaning, you know, a rotating schedule with Unified Arts, that type of thing. Question, what's gonna happen this fall? DESE has indicated in the guidance that their intention for fall, all schools to return to full in-person instruction 
with no district-wide remote option. That has been widely discussed, and um, but parents this year, in fact, have the option to keep their children remote. So that's not, you know, that's that's between that, you know, obviously from if you're elementary, the fifth of April to the end of the school year. Um, can ESSER funds be used to hire new teachers? ESSER one funds uh, remote teachers that were that's that's how we paid for them, and that's how we paid for a lot of the extra staff that we've had to because of COVID related, um, uh, you know, things. In addition, these funds purchase PPE, plexiglass, dividers, software, hardware necessary to uh, for remote instruction. So we have spent, as we were told by the commissioner himself, you spend ESSER one first. Then you spend ESSER 2, which we're moving, you know, forward, right? Um, and we've done that. And we've done that in a way that has been, and I, I, I'm going to say it over and over again, approved by the state. Our plan was approved as, as we had it. If to know now that they were going to have us come back in this configuration, I, I'm not sure we could have done anything different because we had to spend the money that we, that we had at the time um, on, the, on the staff that we had. Um, but it may have changed our thinking. But we were we were hopeful and led to believe that we were going if we were going to come back, we were going to come back in full. In other words, just back, okay. Which obviously, in very uh, very quickly in this whole process, it, it became, you know, we became aware that that wasn't going to be the possibility. Um, will Unified Arts be, uh, be back at TES next year? Yes, of course they will be. Um, you know, we fully intend to go back to normal, you know, uh, you know, putting kids in a normal configuration as we're used to, sitting them, I'm sure that we're gonna have PPE, right? I'm sure masks will still be part of the equation. I'm sure that probably barriers, whatever, but we're gonna have to get out of this three foot piece. And we don't know what monies, if any, what we know that we're getting monies, we know this. And we're just calling it S for three for lack of a better, letter, lack of a better term, but we have no idea what we can spend it on. And um, what are the, you know, what are the, the ramifications of, of, of spending that money on what? Because these are federal grants and we have to be very, very careful on what we can spend it on. So you've already heard the president say that two, uh, you know, two general focuses are um, ventilation, right? Or HVAC um, and gaps, learning gaps. What does that mean entirely? I don't, I don't know. We don't know yet. So to that point, so we'll, we'll have to wait and see, but the information is starting to, we're starting to, you know, it's gonna get here very, it's gonna get here sooner rather than later. The question will become, what do you do if you receive all this money? What, what would you do for FY? Well, again, we'd really be talking about FY23 at this point, right? Um, and I mean, pardon me, FY22, is that we'd, ha we'd have to look at, you know, what our, where our needs are. Right now, staffing wise, they certainly are at TES. Again, it, that's assuming a lot of things that we stay in the same configuration, we're the same three foot, all of those things. Busing is also something we didn't even address here um, at this point in time, but you know, it was, I guess, good that they said that two children per seat um, that, didn't, that were not part of the same family, that, that certainly helped. But at the elementary level, we often sit three to a seat. You know what I mean? So, you know, we're going to, it's, we're still waiting to see what the next, uh, what the next piece is going to be. So we created, what we did is we looked at the total number of kids that we had um, and we made the plan to educate them the, the way I've just described, because we did not want to pivot again, at least under the current plan. If they change something, then we'll have to change something. But if this is the plan moving forward all the way until June, then this is our best attempt right now to keep us from pivoting, which I hate the word, but I'm going to use it in this sense. We wanted to minimize switching, um, you know, students as much as possible, but there's going to be, you know, a couple of things that are definitely going to happen. There are going to be some students um, who are, you know, either remote or otherwise are going to have to switch teachers, right? We, we know that. Um, we also know that regardless of how you're, you're learning uh, in the full remote model that like currently, like exactly the schedule as it sits today right now um, is definitely going to change. It's going to look different or it's going to look different because most likely it's going to be asynchronous. We do not have just dedicated, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, 
online, you know, pardon me, remote teachers. We just not, we're not going to, we just don't have that um, at this point in time. And I've just explained, you know, as I've just explained, I had to use every single certified teacher that I have just to get them in the building. So I realize that that is a very quick explanation to a very complicated issue. Um, it is the information that we, that we have currently right now. Thank you, Dr. Kazavant. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna ask you, maybe if you could pull your presentation down just so I can see the committee, because sure. I'd like to go to the committee first. Um, uh -huh. That was a lot of information. A lot to, of information. I, I believe what everybody says is, you know, to unpack um, as, as we think through this, but I wanna throw it out to the committee first to see if there's any questions um, about this proposal. Um, you know, the state, I, ju I just want to put out there, the state issued their guidelines on March 9th, which was eight days ago. So even though the declaration was made, um, I believe it was the very beginning of March at the very end of February, um, there has been little time to really put a process through. The survey wasn't even ready to be sent out, I think until, I think it was sent to you maybe on Thursday. So we sent it out to the, finally could send it to the parents. So there's been a lot of moving parts to try and put this together. So I just wanna say thank you for um, the time that you and your team have put into trying to come up with a, a plan and a process to make this return on April 5th um, with the, the, the least amount of, of stress and duress and angst. Um, and, and I, you know, listening to the comments from the parents, you know, I, I certainly understand that. Um, what's interesting, and I don't know how many other committee members had a chance to read through the state's guidance, you know, they pretty much stay right in there. You know, unfortunately, there may be some switches to teachers and delivery and, and all sorts of things, um, you know, that the parents will have to unfortunately adjust to um, because the state recognized that. Um, with that being said, is, are there any questions or comments from the committee at this point for Dr. Kazavant? Okay, I don't see any. Um, what I do know, and just, um, I just wanted to highlight because um, this change does not require a school committee vote. I just wanna make that clear to the community as well um, because, and I do wanna just read the statement, but because the regulations have the force of law, once the commissioner made the determination that hybrid and remote learning will no longer count towards structured learning time, the school committee vote on which learning model to adopt is not necessary because he made that change. So this is what the commissioner has deemed that needs to be done. And this is our response to that. The only thing that they did recommend that the school committee um, do vote on if, if there was a meeting that would happen quick enough, which of course we're meeting tonight, would be for the fifth grade and the waiver process. So Dr. Kazman, do you just wanna speak a little bit to that waiver and then we can vote to at least give you the, the ability to go ahead, go forth with that? Thank you, Madam Chair. And this is, the, of all the confusing things, this is right up, up there. So um, they, when they, I, and I have a feeling that because it is written in such a way that elementary was uh, identified or, you know, defined as K through five, um, that they were, you know, once that was done, that the waiver um, that what we're going to be seeking today, um, because at first we were told don't 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 seek a waiver because in X amount of weeks, which one week is April vacation, they'll be coming back to school. Then it, uh, I you know I think they walked that back and during our last commissioners meeting, um, which by the way was the same day that they gave us the, the guidance to do a survey. So I want to make sure that folks know that. We have followed the plan um, by to the T, so to speak. So um, yes, so what it does is this is a waiver that will give me permission in a sense to then uh, petition the state to uh, have the fifth grade be considered in the middle school, which it is in our case in many districts around us. So that way it doesn't, it doesn't have the fifth grade coming back in a building that is, is you know, still on A and B hybrid, which will be problematic it just in terms of how we share staff, et cetera. So that is the waiver that we're seeking that basically that the fifth grade be considered middle school because our fifth grade is in fact in the middle school. Okay, um, any questions or comments on that? I think it's pretty self-explanatory. 
So, all right. So I would entertain a motion to um, allow Dr. Kazavin to proceed with the waiver for the fifth grade um, to not be part of the initial April 5th um, student return, but to then be part of the middle school return on um, August, listen to me, April um, 28th. But I believe you said that we'll be doing the 26th, but the mandate's the 28th. So I would entertain a motion as such. So moved. I have a motion from Mrs. Kozel. Do I have a second? Second. And I have a second from Mr. Mason. Any questions or comments on that? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll do roll call. Mr. Marks? Yes. Mrs. Chartier? Yes. Mrs. Robichaud? Yes. Mr. Uh, uh, Mrs. Matson, sorry. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Kozel? Yes. Mrs. Trifolo? Yes. Mr. Mason? Aye. And Mrs. Hughes says yes. So that was unanimous. So Dr. Kazavant, please go ahead and request the waiver as you deem fit. And uh, we'll move forth with that. Um, quick question for you. Um, will you be doing any additional um, community outreach to take questions? Um, you know, do you have any thoughts in mind yet as to what you might be considering doing for the community? Yes, and, and I think that initially, and I think that you and I may have discussed this, I was going to, uh, we we're going to attempt to do it this week, like say Thursday or Friday after, of course, I presented to the school committee. I, I think just given the, um, uh, the, you know, the amount of change that took place and of course, figuring out where uh, kiddos will be, will be placed, you know, in terms of a class list, I, I'm, it'll probably be early next week, uh, probably honestly, when the, um, when the class lists are distributed to, um, to the parents. And I think that that might be, a, well, it'll be a good time to discuss the entire thing. So I think we'll wait for that because we don't want to have two situations, two opportunities where people may have questions and only, you know, uh, do it too soon. So um, it'll be next, uh, we'd like to do something next week. Great, thank you. Okay, any last um, questions or comments on the return to school? Okay. Um, with that being said, we will move on to the next topic. And I, I'm just, Dr. Kasman, was there anything else COVID related that you wanted to put out there? This is pretty big, so. Yeah, I, I don't think, honestly, I think this is the, the only thing that we've been talking about for okay. several days. So I, I, if there is something pressing, I'm sure that one of my staff will remind me, but as of right now, that's, that's, this is the big ticket item. Great, thank you. Okay, so next up is the school year calendar. At our last meeting, we asked you to convene the calendar committee, um, which I believe you have because we have two versions of a calendar. Um, since we have a, we've had a very full agenda, what I'd like to recommend is maybe if you could just give us um, a quick overview of what the committee had for a recommendation. We'll allow the school committee to review these and next month we'll come back and vote on it. If that I'm gonna let, yeah, absolutely, Madam Chair. I'm gonna let um, Kate, um, talk about that. She was um, she was actually running the meeting at that time. So uh, it's it you know I'll let her take that from here if that's okay, Kate. Thanks. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> the calendar committee met. Um, Ms. Geister was there, so please chime in if there's anything I missed. We came up with two versions of the calendar, but the consensus really is to start before Labor Day. I was trying to pull them up so um but i couldn't find the attachment um we're gonna resume four uh, excuse me six half pd days our usual three full pd days um you know we there was some conversation about the timing of when those days are and, and everyone was in agreement with them i guess the big change really that i would see is that um rather than having half days for the high school for midterms and finals, the high school is gonna to move to half days for conferences um, following the middle school model. So there would be two days in the spring, two days, two days in the fall, two days in the spring, one evening in the fall and one evening in the spring. And those would be the two contractually required um, evenings for staff and uh, midterms and finals would still be given, but um, during a class period without a modified schedule. Any any questions so far from the, the committee? 
Okay, I don't see any. So what we'll do is we'll take a chance to digest the, the two calendars that are attached to the agenda. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, they can reach out to Dr. Kazavan or Ms. Kalis um, with the questions. And then next month when we come back, we'll vote on a calendar next month. So um, we will move on. Uh, are there any other just general school committee comments? Ms. Triflo, yes. Well, relative to the calendar, the question comes up about snow days and how it might affect the calendar. With the remote um, having been used this year, will we have snow days next year? And how maybe there's some discussion along with thinking as to how we would um, divvy those up and how we best seen it done, how we best see it done. So um, I would you know, defer to Dr. Caspian, but I, I just would say that um, given how last year and the year before there's been discussion about blizzard bags and so forth, our teachers have mastered the art of teaching remotely. However, I haven't heard any indication from the state that they would allow that. So uh, that's what I would like Dr. Caspian to weigh in on. So, um, it, yes. So, just real quick, um, at first he said you could use remote days. This was back in the summertime um, and for, for any type of particular snow day, um, gave us permission to do that. Then, I, you know, a lot of information, someone had asked him, they said, well, no. And so he had to be reminded that he had said it already and people had already, had already tweaked their calendars. So I, it, it was made clear at that point in time that, um, that, that any type, any such um, opportunity has to come from the state level. So as of right now, it goes back to almost two years ago where they had to remember anybody who was part of the program was grandfathered in for that year and then it was going to stop. So it, next year, he will have to, the, the commissioner will have to um, allow that to be a, a consideration for the school committee. So as of right now, if it snows, it's a snow day. Great. Okay, and that's important for I think parents have some insight in as they look at that calendar. Good, good point, Mrs. Triflo. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, right. It'll be interesting to see, you know, if if there is any any give or take for at the state level on that, um, it, and it'll be interesting. I think that'll play into how many schools are able to come back and the force to not go remote and how that plays in. So. Okay, so we'll vote on that, as I said, next month to finalize the calendar, um, but they are, the two drafts are out on, attached to the agenda for anyone who wants to see them, if the public wants to just take a look. Yes, Mrs. Triplo. Well, it also is relevant as to how those uh, Chromebooks um, would need to be used next year when that comes up and how they'll be returned this year. Um, so that's another procedural thing that we'll have to look at. Yes. Good point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Madam, uh, Madam Chair, can I just make one comment too? With all the talk, I mean, we have a lot of talk about returning to campus and everything. Um, I just, I don't want it to get forgotten. I think with uh, the students, you know, we're requiring the students to go back um, and everything. I think this committee should return to um, in-person meetings at some point as well. Um, I think that's important just so that, you know, everybody else is going, then we should be doing the same thing. So I just don't want to get that, that to get lost. So we should, um, at the very least, keep that on the agenda and, and, and keep that up there. So, okay. Yes, thank you, Mr. Marks, for bringing that up. Um, I, I think we had initially wanted and hoped back in February to do so. Unfortunately, the governor still has some um, requirements around the number of people that can be at a meeting or in a space. So as we see those things loosen up, and as we see maybe some other changes to potentially the open meeting law and participation, um, we will do our best to be back in person. I think if I look around and I see all the faces on the screen, every one of us wants to be back in person. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, and we will do our best because you're right, if our kids can be back, why can't we? Um, and it seems silly that there's a mandate that you can't have more than what is it, 25 people in a room, yet we may have more kids than that, say in, in the, the gym eating, eating lunch. It does this, none of this really works together, um, but we are still constrained because since we have an open meeting, we have to allow the public in 
and that could uh, have be an issue with the the constraints on the number of people allowed in a space. So, um, as I said, thank you for that reminder, and we will do our best to get back in person as soon as possible. So, Kate, yep. I'm sorry. I just um, something happened today that I just really feel like I need to um, mention to the team because it's an example of how our teachers are really just um, doing a tremendous job and rolling with everything that's come their way. Ms. Um, Saltizic and Mrs. Bashand had um, a staff meeting today. And at that time they, you know, presented the plan to staff. Of course, Dr. Casavant had spoken to individual staff beforehand, but so, so Ms. Saltizic is, is going through the plan and, and talking about how we're gonna have some teachers new at grade levels. Um, you know, that maybe haven't done this before. And the first comment a teacher made was welcome to the team. And I just wanna say that because it really, you know, showed me the kind of teachers that we have and they're gonna really all pull together. Um, just an, an example of how they work together. That's great, thank you for sharing that. All right, any, any other questions? I'm sorry, and any other comments? No questions, no more questions. Any other comments? Okay, we're gonna move on. We have just a couple of quick things to vote on. Um, we have some surplus items. So I would entertain a motion to surplus the following items. They are listed out on the agenda. Um, they are all computer equipment. I am not going to read them because they are on the report that is presented, but they are um, items such as broken and salvageable things that we just need to get rid of. Um, I would entertain to a motion to Yep. Entertain oh. a motion to surplus the items that have been presented to us. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Marks. Do I have a second? Second. And I have a second for Mrs. Oh. Coach. Any questions or comments on these items? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call. Mr. Marks? Yes. Mrs. Chartier? Yes. Mrs. Robichaud? Yes. Mrs. Matson. Yes. Mrs. Kojal? Yes. Mrs. Trifolo? Yes. Mr. Mason? Aye. And Mrs. Hughes says yes. So we have unanimously voted to uh, surplus the items that have been listed. Uh, the second thing we have to vote on is just an acceptance of a donation attached to the, uh, the agenda. And I just wanna pull it up real quick so I can um, read this because it is a wonderful donation. Um, we received a donation from Dean's Beans Organic Coffee Company um, in the, to the tune of $3,000. So I would entertain a motion to accept this donation from Dean's Beans. So moved. I have a motion from Mr. Marks. Do I have a second? Second. Thanks. And a second from, I think it was Mrs. Triple O I heard first. Any questions or comments? Thanks. Seeing none, we'll do roll call. Mr. Marks? Yes. Mrs. Chartier? Yes. Mrs. Robichaud? Yes. Mrs. Matson? Yes, but Mrs. I also have a question. Sure. What was it for? They put it for um, food services in the meal program. But if you recall, uh, the policy, actually the law states that any donation received um, is, is used at the discretion of, of the school committee. We accept the donations. When we get a donation, though, if someone has a specific intent, we do our best to always make sure it ends up there because that would defeat the purpose of someone making future donations. So it will go to the, uh, you know, it'll go into the fund and then be allocated as such. So, um, and that was a, you gave me, I think you said yes already, Mrs. Matson. Um, Mrs. Kojal? Yes. Mrs. Trifolo? Yes. Mr. Mason? Aye. And Mrs. Hughes says yes. So that was unanimous. And um, if we could just prepare our usual thank you letter um, to Dean's Beans, letting them know how, how much we appreciate them thinking of our, our district, uh, especially at this time. All right. Okay, there were no items that came up um, that ha are not on the agenda. Um, I'm going to throw it over to Dr. Casavant for the superintendent report. I know we've covered a whole bunch of things. I think really the only other thing that we have to talk about is just a quick regional agreement amendment committee update and, um, and just to follow up on the PMES building. Um, I know because we turned that over and just, just to, if there was anything else that was outstanding with that. I can say that um, right off the bat for the TES, um... Uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the, PM, the, turnover, yes. the PM, sorry, um, there was, there has been nothing further. So I, um, you know, we received a nice um, email from the town administrator um, from Phillipston and we've, you know, 
we haven't heard back again. So I think that that is, um, that is behind us. Um, in regards to the, um, we continue, I really defer to the chair, Mr. Marks, if he would like to, you know, talk about um, what our next steps are, um, you know, just, I don't want to overstep. So I, I want to make sure that I give him the. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Well, we're actually, we're actually going through, um, we've, we've tentatively agree, um, agree, approved um, 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 several of the items on the uh, agreement. Um, we've been going through um, a lot of them, uh, uh, several of them went through very quickly. Some of them that there are questions on, we're going back to um, review later. Um, um, we have a meeting, I believe it is next, it, it's, we have a meeting coming up next week um that's really that's really all i have chris I, I i do only have one piece of and i and it is i don't mean to say tragically sad but it is sad and if i may um i did uh, receive um although i refused it at first but i did receive um mr rick moulton's resignation as of june 30th apparently he wants to retire um we we denied that initially, quite frankly, <laughs> um, and um, apparently we can't. He, he can, in fact, retire. Um, he wrote a very lovely note to us, um, and, uh, but so I'm, I'm just obviously notifying the committee that we'll, we'll start um, that process, um, and it will be uh, on June 30th, and you know, so he's got some traveling to do, um, his wife, for some reason, would like you know him to be around more. We we're not sure why, but that that's that's his business. Um, but obviously, you know how we feel about Rick and the work that he's done here, and um, and certainly uh, you know as a graduate, um, the things he said. The class of seventy two or seventy three. I always you know I always kind of forget, but this is a class of seventy three. How can anyone forget? Um, but he has really treated this place like a second home, and, and it showed because we're we're a lot better. Um, for having him uh, during this time. But we still have a few more months to uh, work him very, 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 very hard. <laughs> uh, but we will be starting the process of looking for a, um, a new uh, director of facility. Well, that's sad for us, but um, good, good for Mr. Moulton um, to be able to do some traveling and spend more time now with his family. So um, let us know, you know, as you come to that point with your uh, posting for the job. And, um, you know, I know we have someone who's familiar with facilities on this committee, which might be a good fit for a search committee. Jeff's laughing at me um, or anyone else on the committee that may be interested. So thank you for, for letting us know about that. Uh, I will. And um, I, it, more to come on that, obviously, but we'll, I'll keep you advised. Great. Thank you. Okay, next up we have curriculum and instruction. I think the, the, um, the two things that we really just wanted to, to highlight um, is we were going to discuss the change to the program of studies for the school year 2020-2021, which is the current year regarding the advanced placement AP section. And this is the same vote that we did last year, um, that we needed to change some language in the program of studies. Um, so we had met at the academic administrative subcommittee meeting and discussed this. And, and I believe Kate, you came back that you had discussed with the high school team that we would make the same change that we had done the year before. And what this has to do is I'm just gonna kind of read what the, what, the, um, what the language is so that I can highlight what struck. So it'll just make it easier when we go to make a motion about it. Um, there's language in the um, program of studies. It says that the AP examination is a requirement for anyone choosing to take an AP course. Student who, students who choose not to take the examination are required to pay the fee and lose the AP designation on a transcript. The course will be changed to honors on the permanent record and the grade point average recalculated. For college-bound seniors, the notice is sent with the final transcript mailed to the college of the student's choice, indicating the change on the transcript. The, the, the fee for the examination is subject to change. We would strike that. Um, and of course, this all relates to um, the changes in obviously the struggles with instruction through this whole year and the reason we're doing that. And I believe even uh, last year, all of the AP exams were done online. This mm -hmm. year, I know they're offering either method and there's, there's still a lot of, I think, gray area when it comes to these AP tests. Um, so that is the, the reason for striking this language for this year. Um, Kate, did you have any more to add? 
No, I think that covers it. All right, I'm trying now. We've got it's late. I'm trying to push through, so I don't want to miss anything though. So, with that being said, um, I would entertain a motion to strike the language that I just read from the 2020-2021 program of studies found under that advanced placement AP section, students choosing an AP course. So moved. I have a motion by Mrs. Matson. Do I have a second? Second. And I have a second from, was that Mrs. Robichaud? Yes, okay. Any questions or comments from the committee on this? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call. Mr. Marks? Yes. Mrs. Chartier? Yes. Mrs. Robichaud? Yes. Mrs. Matson? Yes. Mrs. Kojal? Yes. Mrs. Trifolo? Yes. Mr. Mason? Aye. And Mrs. Hughes says yes, so that was unanimous. So Ms. Kalise, if you wouldn't mind just notifying the, um, the high school that we did go ahead and make that motion to make that change sure. for the year and they can make whatever procedural things they need to have happen um, on there and that would be great. And the second piece for this was the program of studies. I don't know if you had a quick update on where we are because I know we look to get that probably in the next couple of months to review and then approve. Yes, so... Um... Mr. Young and Ms. Brown have been working hard getting, um, in, getting a, a sense of student interest in courses over the last um, couple of weeks so that they can um, appropriately update the program studies. The descriptions of the courses that they intend to either add or change have been written at this time. Um, they're now in the process of reviewing the whole document to just make sure it's coherent um, and makes sense to the reader. They anticipate a fully revised program of studies to be available to the school committee um, right after April vacation. Excellent. Thank you. Any questions or comments for Ms. Calise from the committee? No, thank you. And um, we look forward to seeing that program of studies when it's ready. And, uh, and that's great, thank you. Um, next up is our subcommittee reports. Um, I think we have covered almost everything during our meeting that we've done in subcommittees. Um, I know, Jeff, your diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, I would like to just ask if we could push off a full update to next month. And what I'd like to do is give you your own agenda item um, in the, the body of the meeting so that you can spend a little time talking to us about where you are, especially as it relates to um, the mascot and some other things, because I think you guys have been doing a lot of work um, that doesn't get covered in some of these agenda items. So if that would be okay, if, that I could do that? Uh, that would be fine, yep. Okay. Perfect, so we'll make sure that we have an agenda item for you next month. Um, any, other, any other subcommittee need to say anything? I think I'd touch base with most everybody. Um, and I don't think so. Okay. Nope. All right. Um, correspondence, we, I did mention there are two letters attached there that also had to do with the music program. So they're there to be read and they were also sent to the committee uh, in advance. Upcoming meetings. Um, our next meeting we had initially um, scheduled for Wednesday, April 21st, which is the Wednesday during school vacation. And the reason we had done that was because we were trying to work with the TCTV schedule. Um, one of the things that um, we've been able to do is to get our um, Zoom webinar feature up and running, um, which will allow us to allow the public into our meetings um, and so we can run them ourselves. I know there's a lot of background things that we need to do and we wanna still work with the TCTV folks to get our videos out. And, and there's a lot of things I don't even understand in the background that, would, that can happen. Um, so, and I apologize to, to Steve and the TCTV guys for bringing this up because we haven't had a chance yet to kind of circle back with you um, and discuss this. But what I wanted to put out to the committee is um, if it would be okay to move our next meeting to April 14th from the 21st because I've gotten some comments that that vacation week does not work for several people and I want to ensure we have a quorum as well as with everything going on I want us to meet sooner rather than later in case there's business that we need to address so anyone have an issue with the 14th okay so we'll look to move that to the 14th and um, Susan you and I can talk about what that means you know procedurally and what we have to do um, and and speaking to whoever we need to to make that happen 
And that is all on our agenda tonight. We initially had executive session, which we will not be going into this evening. So with that being said, um, unless anybody has any last minute things to say. Motion to adjourn. Thank you. I have a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second for Mrs. Kojal. Let's do a roll call. Mr. Marks? Yes. Mrs. Chartier? Yes. Mrs. Robichaud? Yes. Mrs. Matson. Yes. Mrs. Kojal? Yes. Mrs. Trifolo? Yes. Mr. Mason? Aye. Mrs. Hughes says yes, and I would like to thank the public and everyone here for coming this evening and uh, all the input that was put into everything that was presented and uh, have a wonderful evening, everybody. This meeting is now